The recommendation acknowledges the role of NHRIs as pillars of the rule of law, human rights and democracy in Europe, and makes strong recommendations to the Council of Europe member states to establish, maintain and strengthen NHRIs in compliance with the Paris principles and to create an enabling environment for NHRIs, including through stronger cooperation with authorities at national level and at the Council of Europe. We will begin our proceedings today with a presentation from Krista Oynonen, Chair of the Drafting Group of the Recommendation and Director at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Finland on the added value and potential of the recommendation. And this will be followed by a keynote speech of Berber Höfler, the Commissioner for Human Rights Policy and Humanitarian Assistance for the German Federal Government, who will inform us why the recommendation is a priority for the German Presidency of the Committee of Ministers, our co-host today. And this morning, we will have two panel discussions on how the recommendations will make a difference to the work of NHRIs, both for implementation at national level and for engagement with intergovernmental processes and independent oversight bodies at the Council of Europe. I strongly encourage the NHRIs and others present to reflect on their experience and to share their thoughts on the opportunities for implementing the recommendation at national and regional level to enable NHRIs to effectively promote and protect human rights. Please feel free to use the chat box to submit your questions and comments throughout the meeting. Our discussions and reflections today will then be taken on board tomorrow for a strategic meeting with heads and representatives of NHRIs to develop an action plan as a follow-up to the recommendation. And the outcomes of this high level event will serve as a starting point for evaluating the implementation of the recommendation by member states in dialogue and cooperation with NHRIs. So that in five years time, when the Committee of Ministers will reflect on the implementation of the recommendation, we hope progress will be apparent <coughs> excuse me, across the Council of Europe. So finally, I want to wish us all a very productive and exciting meeting full of learning, sharing of experience, and practical ideas for how the recommendation can be implemented to enhance the promotion and protection of human rights across the region and strengthen cooperation between NHRIs, ENRI, the Council of Europe and its member states. And I am now delighted to give the floor to Krista Oynen, Chair of the Drafting Group of the Recommendation and Director of the Unit for Human Rights Courts and Conventions at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Finland. Ms. Oynen has played a pivotal role in negotiating this strong recommendation on NHRIs and is a true ally for strong NHRIs and vibrant civil society space in Europe. Colleagues at the German Presidency team, dear participants, uh, I'm pleased to introduce you to the Council of Europe's new recommendation to member states on the development and strengthening of effective pluralist independent national human rights institutions adopted by the Committee of Ministers. It aims at creating favorable conditions for NHRs to operate as part of the wider rule of law framework. The Council of Europe seeks to keep the European standard high, perhaps the highest in the world. In Helsinki in May 2019, the Committee of Ministers agreed to examine further options for strengthening the role and meaningful participation of NHRIs in the organization with a view to increasing its openness and transparency, including access to information, activities and events. The unique role of NHRIs as part of the human rights structures of the state established by the constitution or law and at the same time as an independent actor offers enormous potential for upholding human rights. In their NHRIs that engage in critical independent thinking and are allowed and supported to exercise leadership for human rights are in the interests of us all. And this is what this recommendation is about. Could we have second slide, please? We shall look now at the adoption of the recommendation. The task of drafting it was entrusted to a small drafting group under the auspices of the Steering Committee for Human Rights. I am very pleased that this recommendation has been prepared transparently and many stakeholders have been involved in drafting it. The drafting group CDDH INST had the privilege of hearing and consulting frontline experts such as ENRI, NHRIs, OHCHR, OSCE, ODI, FRA, 
the International Ombudsman Institute, the Office of the Council of Europe's Commissioner for Human Rights, and the INGO Conference. All this, I believe, increases the shared ownership of the content of this recommendation by all of us. And it is noteworthy that this recommendation is by no means the first recommendation of the Council of Europe on NHRIs. It replaces an older recommendation adopted in 1997. Third slide, please. This recommendation is part of a larger Council of Europe's package to strengthen independent human rights structures and protect the free and safe space for human rights actors in Europe. The Committee of Ministers adopted the recommendation on the promotion and protection of civil society space in Europe in 2018 and a year later on the Ombudsman Institution. And together now these three will constitute a comprehensive and progressive package. In the next slide, we see how the unique independent status of NHRIs and the important practical connection with other human rights actors are well reflected in the recommendation. This recommendation acknowledges that NHRIs are human rights defenders, which contribute to the promotion and protection of human rights defenders and to a safe and enabling space for civil society. It also recognizes NHRIs as an important link between government and civil society insofar as they help bridge the potential protection gap, the rights of individuals and the responsibilities of the state. Let's look at the next slide. This slide provides reasons behind this new recommendation. The main reason is the increase in the number of NHRIs and the rapid development of their mandates. Today, 41 out of 47 Council of Europe member states have an NHRI in place. 29 member states have an NHRI in full compliance with the Paris Principles with A status. Nine have a partially compliant NHRI with B status, and three member states have an institution in place that is not internationally accredited. The relevance and importance of NHRIs have grown, effectiveness and impact have increased, mandates and tasks have expanded, and definitely diversity has increased. The next slide, unfortunately, illustrates also some other reasons for the need of this recommendation. Some European NHRIs are subject to restrictions on their activities, the gradual erosion of their independence, targeted cuts in funding and human resources, as well as intimidation and harassment. I think it's quite shocking that we have to express this kind of serious about through this recommendation. Next slide. The actual recommending part provides eight recommendations to the member states. First, we have a clear and strong recommendation on the establishment of an NHRI, and when already established, on the need to maintain and strengthen its independence in accordance with the Paris Principles. The recommendation encourages to seek technical assistance from ENRI and regional and each and international bodies to build on existing best practices. The most Crucial precondition for an independent and effective NHRI is a solid, rock-hard legal basis and a clear mandate, preferably at the constitutional level. And here our wording is slightly stronger than that of the Paris Principles by stating that an NHRI should be provided a firm legal basis, preferably at the constitutional level. Let's look at the next slide. This highlights how the recommendation is pragmatic, well-balanced, and it offers a new framework for effective action and cooperation. Here I would like to emphasize that member states should evaluate on a regular basis the effectiveness of the measures taken in the, in the implementation of the appendix to this recommendation, including through consultation and dialogue with NHRIs at the country level. And here I encourage sharing good and innovative practices. Let's look at the following one. We should also explore the ways of developing a stronger role for and meaningful participation of NHRIs and ENRI in the Council of Europe. 
My own experience as a member of the steering committee for human rights is that ENRI's involvement enriches our work. ENRI and NHR rights provide substantial support and assistance, and I can recognize their tremendous potential to provide for innovative solutions and proposals for the member states in upholding and promoting human rights. However, there is still no streamlined Council of Europe in engagement with NHRIs. The degree and, and format of participation is still very case specific or committee specific, and here we need to take steps forward. NHRI should have their own central online access point with all the relevant information on how NHRIs can engage across Council of Europe bodies. And I believe that the Office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights provides here a very good practice in this regard. Let's look at the following slide. As I already mentioned, the recommendation has an appendix with four chapters, establishment on NHRIs, strengthening of NHRIs, securing and expanding a safe and enabling environment for NHRIs and cooperation and support. And these recommendations are very detailed, practice oriented. And these chapters emphasize in detail that NHRIs should have four different types of independence. That is legal, operational, policy, and financial independence. And let's look at the final slide. And that is to take action now. This recommendation sets a good signal of our commitment to work together to improve the effectiveness, independence, and impact of NHRIs, both nationally and in the Council of Europe framework. Now, it is time to translate this recommendation into official and minority languages, disseminate it broadly and keep it on the agenda. We must build on the momentum achieved to ensure that NHRIs are able to deliver on their mandate. Now it is time to inter interact with governments and, if need be, seek support from ENRI and the Council of Europe institutions. They are there to help. At this point, I want to emphasize that the recommendation requires to include NHRIs in the national follow-up procedure. To conclude this brief presentation, I quote the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights. Justice must not only be done, it must also be seen to be done. And I believe that this same principle applies to the establishment and strengthening of NHRIs. It is not enough that NHRIs are established and made independent and effective by the letter of the law. It must also be seen to be done in practice. Let's implement the excellent recommendation now. I thank you. So. Yeah, good morning from my side. I'm Michael Winfer, the Deputy Director of the German Institute for Human Rights, and I will moderate the first panel this morning. First, I would like to thank really Christa Eunun for your very clear presentation of the content of the recommendation of the Committee of Ministers and also the avenues for follow-up, which you have already indicated. But I would also like to thank you maybe in the name of whole ENRI and all of the National Human Rights Institution for your skillful chairing of the drafting group um, of the Council of Europe steering group on human rights, which has managed to develop this uh, recommendation, which is a groundbreaking recommendation for us as national human rights institutions. Thanks for this. Now I would like hand, to hand over the floor to Bärbel Kofler, uh, the Federal Governor's Commissioner for Human Rights Policy and Humanitarian Assistance in our ministry. Um, for foreign affairs. Uh, we strongly collaborate. We even uh, at the beginning of the German presidency of the Committee of Ministers made a big conference together with our Justice Ministry on the 70th anniversary of the European Convention of Human Rights. So we have a strong collaboration already. I'm really glad to introduce Bärbel Kofler to you. Um, she will deliver a keynote speech which will be followed by an interactive panel discussion. Uh, and after the panel discussion, there will be also time for interventions from the floor and questions of answers to the panelists. But Werbel Kofler will also be on that panel. So questions and answers 
then will be also possible to address the Bärbel Kofler directly. So now I hand over to you, Ms. Kofler. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Winfor. But we have to point out that you are independent. Yes, we collaborate very, very strongly, but you are independent institute Definitely. and we are very proud of that. <laughs> so I just want to underline that in the beginning. Um, well, yeah, dear Professor Fennell, dear Director Oynonen, dear co-panelists, Mr. Winfor, dear ladies and gentlemen, before I begin, let me thank the European Network of National Human Rights Agencies for bringing us all together on that meeting. I think it is very important to have an interaction like we will have today. Well, in a few days, we will mark 70 years since Germany became a full member state of the Council of Europe. And that is very meaningful to us. After World War II and the singular horrors unleashed by Germany, it was a remarkable act of reconciliation. The members of the Council of Europe offered to the young Federal Republic the chance to see eye to eye with its neighbors and to help create a new Europe resting firmly on human rights, democracy, and the rule of law. In the 70 years since, partnership and cooperation for human rights have grown. So as the membership of the Council of Europe, it now comprises 47 member states covering an area from Lisbon to Vladivostok, from Baku to Reykjavik. When the European Convention on Human Rights, it's more than 200 other treaties and conventions, and the European Court of Human Rights, the Council of Europe has created a strong and unique system of human rights protection. Yet this system also relies on the work of independent human rights organizations, the National Human Rights Institutes among them. Effective, pluralist, and independent national human rights institutions are among the pillars of respect for human rights, the rule of law, and democracy. This is rightly stated in the Committee of Ministers' recently adopted recommendations on the NHREs, as we just heard. And as Director Oynonen already was uh, pointing out, currently 41 out of 47 member states in the Council of Europe have national human rights institutes in place. 29 of these are in full compliance uh, with the United Nations standards uh, set out in the Paris principles. Nine are in partial compliance. While this majority of member states thus have NH NHREs in place, there remains a need to strengthen them. We just heard about that also in the presentation of the recommendations. Moreover, national human rights institutes and their staff in some member states face challenging working conditions, threats, pressures, and attacks. I therefore very much appreciate the Committee of Minister, Ministers and the German Presidency has adopted these recommendations. It represents a strong recognition of the important work national human rights institutions have been, have been doing. I, it also sets forth an agenda to establish such institutions where this has not yet been the case and to strengthen those that do exist. In Germany, we have worked with the German Institute for Human Rights during our presidency. Mr. Winfor was pointing that out kindly. Most prominently, the Foreign Office and the Ministry of Justice and Consumer Protection organized a conference celebrating the 17th anniversary of the European Convention on Human Rights together with the Institute. But we have also worked with them on a range of other issues in their 20 years history. For example, on human rights due diligence in global sup supply chains and Sherman's performance under the Universal Periodical Review. Their contribution is inval invaluable due to their expertise, independence, and impartiality. They are not always this is not always pleasant for us as a government, but that's how it is. And I'm convinced that this is the only way to make progress. Now that our presidency is already uh, nearing its conclusion at the meeting of uh, the 47 foreign ministers on the May 20th and 21st, Allow me to reflect briefly on some of the highlights and some of the challenges during that time. Let me begin with the execution of judgments. The European Court of Human Rights ensures that decisions by the member states' courts comply with the European Convention on Human Rights. 
In 2020, the court delivered more than 1,900 judgments. Member states executed the vast, vast majority of these decisions. Yet there are some cases where member states do not comply. To name some very prominent examples, the incarceration of Osman Kavala and Salahattin Demirtas in Turkey and of Alexei Navalny in Russia are political motivated. The respective decisions by the European Court of Human Rights are clear. These judgments are binding for Turkey and Russia as member states. The Committee of Ministers has therefore demanded immediate release in all three cases. And I also want to admit personally, I'm very concerned by recent reports on the health uh, of Alexei Navalny the execution of judgments remains a high priority to our presidency. Well, but a strong commitment to the rule of law also means taking one's obligations seriously. This is why we support the accession of the European Union to the European Convention on Human Rights. During our presidency, we have supported uh, negotiations led by the European Commission by holding talks with individual member states. EU accession to the convention would close a gap in the system of human rights protection in Europe. It is therefore important that the ongoing negotiations progress swiftly. Moreover, challenges posed by technology have been high on our agenda. For instance, with regard to online hate speech. A conference we hosted in January on the human rights implication of artificial intelligence displayed the huge public interest and appreciation uh, for the Council of Europe's work in this area. A fitting European framework on artificial intelligence might be able to set international standards that apply even beyond Europe. The Council of Europe is the right forum to develop such a framework. Another human rights issue that sadly has worsened during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic as violence against women. In many countries, lockdowns have led to a deeply concerning increase in cases of domestic violence. Against this backdrop, Turkey's withdrawal from the Istanbul Convention was a worrying signal for Europe, but most importantly for the women in Turkey. The convention's aim is to protect women from violence. There is no hidden agenda behind that. It's protecting women from violence. Cultural or religious, uh, religious tradition must not be abused to justify violence against women. We must not tolerate it in our societies. In a joint statement, the Council of Europe Secretary General, the President of the Parliamentary Assembly and the German for, uh, Foreign Minister Heiko Maas have therefore called up uh, upon Turkey not to weaken the international system for the protection of women from violence. Chancellor Merkel has recently reiterated our concerns in the parliamentary assembly. On the Istanbul Convention's 10 years anniversary on May 11th, we will organize a high level conference together with the Council of Europe. It will again lay out the convention's importance for the protection of women's rights. Well, during our presidency, we have worked very closely with groups who, are often, who often find themselves mar marginalized in politics and society. In particular, we have, put out, uh, we have put a focus on Europe's biggest minority, the Roma, and organized several events around International Roma Day on April 8th. And moreover, youth work and the participation of young people have been a priority for us. Well, with all this, I would like to conclude, and I'm looking forward to the roundtable discussion and especially to your questions. And I wish all the uh, events planned today by the uh, network a very successful and fruitful outcome. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, um, Ms. Kofler, uh, for highlighting which roles you see important for national human rights institutions. Thanks for highlighting the importance of independence and that it might cause also some problems internally because you might get a certain degree of criticism or the, the degree needed maybe. But also thanks for pinpointing to the threats 
for independence, but also personal or institutional uh, intimidations, which has been seen in some of the Council of Europe member states for national human rights institutions. I think that is already setting the tone a bit for our panel, which we are now going um, to have. And uh, this panel, the first panel of the two we have this morning, will look into the intergovernmental processes to from, from that process to the national implementation, cooperation and support uh, of national human rights institutions with member states and also international non-governmental organizations. So that's very helpful and thanks for um, that. And also thanks, uh, Ms. Kofla, for staying with us on the panel. And maybe I just introduce the other panel members and I guess it will be possible to see us all then on the, uh, let's say, screen, so that we look a bit like as if we would sit in a formal panel. <laughs> and uh, first, uh, I would like to say hello to Lord Richard Ball. Uh, he's member of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. Thanks for being with us this morning and uh, a warm welcome. Uh, the second speaker who will be with us is uh, Christoph Boyrell. Uh, Director for Human Rights of the Council of Europe. Uh, also very warm welcome to you. And the last uh, in our order, but not the least, is uh, Antoine Bause, rep representing the Conference of International Non-Governmental Organization. But I think he's also professor at the Utrecht University for International Law. So welcome the four of you. And um, we have uh, some time uh, to speak together. I will ask you all some questions. Then we will have a short response also from two members of heads of institutions, national human rights institutions. And then we have also a place where um, uh, questions and answers from the audience can come. That is the agenda for our meeting. And um, I will start now with the uh, Lord Balf. The Rec Council of Europe recommendation indicates that governments should establish, maintain, strengthen an effective pluralist and independent national human rights institutions uh, in line with the principles fleshed out with the recommendation. Um, based on your experience as rapporteur in the uh, parliamentary assembly, uh, how can the parliamentary assembly contribute to advancing the goals set um, by the recommendation for each council of member states? to have an effective pluralist and independent national human rights institution in place. Lord Balf, please. Thank you, Chair. Let me first say, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure for me to attend this virtual conference today and to present the work of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. Although recommendation CM 2021 is devoted to NHRIs, the Parliamentary Assembly work is also relevant in this context. Whilst recognising that the Paris Principles are not applicable to all types of ombudsman institutions, as not all NHRIs are classical ombudsman institutions, the Assembly has consistently stressed the need to follow the principles and has focused mainly on the need to strengthen the institution of ombudsman. There are three points that need to be borne fair, firmly in mind in our view. Firstly, a good ombudsman may well say things that you might not wish to hear. Secondly, a good ombudsman person will defend good and transparent administrative practice. And thirdly, a good ombudsperson will be seen to be independent of political pressure. If they're insulted and called names by all parties in the political spectrum, they're doing their job well. If everybody is saying what marvellous people they are, they are probably failing to defend the citizen. And that's a very good starting point to come from. Now, the, the Parliamentary Assembly has promoted the creation and strengthening of ombudsman institutions since the 1980s, in particular its resolution 1959 of 2013, and though I say it myself, my own report, resolution 2301 of 2019 and recommendation 2163 of the same year. 
they were based on my report. And one of the great advantages of the Council of Europe is that it enables people to come together in a non-coercive way. One of the fact differences, big differences, between the European Union, where I was a member of parliament for 25 years, and the Council of Europe, is that the Council of Europe is, of course, a voluntary assembly and has a much wider base. So it does have a different job to do. People sometimes speak as though they're the same institution and one is the waiting room for the other, but they're not. They're quite different institutions. And the Council of Europe and the Assembly have consistently promoted the strengthening of ombudsman institutions. This goes right back to 1975 and its recommendation 757 and recommendation 1615 of 2003 where we invited member states to establish the institutions and called for the strengthening of these institutions in Europe. My report last year being the most recent recalls that most member states of the Council of Europe have established institutions, but there's no standardized model. But nonetheless, the three principles I mentioned a few minutes ago should underlie whichever type of ombudsman organization you have. In parallel with the work on my report, we also have the work of the Venice Commission, which I was privileged to serve on for some years as a representative of the Legal Affairs Committee of the Council of Europe. Now, the unique selling point of the Venice Commission is, of course, that it is a commission of experts not of parliamentarians. That's not to say that the Council of Europe doesn't have many excellent administrative officials who contribute greatly to the development of this policy. But the Venice Commission principles, which were adopted in March and endorsed in Resolution 2301 of 2019, stress that states should, should avoid any action which undermined the ombudsman institutions, and it should promote an ombudsman-friendly climate. All members of the Venice Commission that have not yet established the classical ombudsman institutions are invited by the Venice principles to correct this and to establish them. We also proposed that there should be a monitoring system for both the Venice Principles and the Paris Principles and cooperation between the Council of Europe and the United Nations should also be developed. Some of the recommendations included in the resolution were positively addressed by the Committee of Ministers in their recommendation to Member States on the development of Ombudsman institutions adopted on the 16th of October 2019. One of the sad things of the last year, of course, has been that because of COVID, it's been virtually a lost year. We're constantly referring to 2019, but as yet the Council of Europe at member level is not fully meeting. But when it does, one of its jobs will be to look at developing principles for the protection of human rights institutions in Europe and to express concern when they're undermined. Personally, my belief is that we need to construct a system of mutual support, the online access point that has been mentioned, and also build structures where there can be an interdependence between ombudsman institutions. All too often, an ombudsman or ombudsperson, sorry, I keep on getting the language wrong, an ombudsperson can be a very lonely person. And the one place where they can get some solace and confirmation is by an effective international organization on a voluntary basis. And my own feeling is that the Council of Europe could play a valuable role in helping establish such a body 
where ombudsmen could not only meet on, say, an annual basis, but also where they could exchange information. Now, the information in one country might not always be appropriate to another, but there are also a great number of times that you can discover wheels and you can spend a lot of time discovering the same wheel. So information exchange and the ability to consult, the ability to pick up a phone and to have a human <coughs> relationship with another ombudsman is a vital step forward. And that, as I see it, is our future. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Lord Balf, uh, also for indicating what um, potential uh, things we should do together, how important coordination is, learning from each other, knowledge exchanging. And thanks for also pinpointing to the differences which we have in the institutions, which belongs to maybe the national settings, but it's also valuable that we have maybe different approaches in different countries, but we should be in an exchange. And you also said, we need to have uh, the respect to the independence everywhere and an ombuds person's friendly climate or national human rights institutions friendly climate in all the member states. I think that is um, a very good reminder to us. Um, thanks for that. I also ask in the chat, maybe if you want to raise a question later, please indicate that you would like to speak and then I can uh, uh, give you the floor when we have the session. Yeah, so first let's talk, let's speak with the panelists and then we come back to all the questions and answers from the floor. So the next I would like to address is Antoine Bause, um, which are according to you, the most important recommendations from the um, text of the res uh, recommendation, which should be implemented and why? What is in your point of view really essential? Thank you, Chair, and good morning, everyone. Pleasure to be here this morning. Uh, well, for me, in the in the recommendation, the, the link the or bridge metaphor is quite important um, because the recommendation specifies that NHRIs are themselves human rights defenders, um, like was also indicated in the earlier recommendation of a few years ago on civil society space, which Krista Oynonen also mentioned. And in that capacity, NHRIs, and here I, I can quote the just adopted recommendation, uh, contribute to the promotion and protection of other human rights defenders and to a safe and enabling space for civil society. So in my view, in an ideal situation, they can stand side by side um, and support those within civil society whose rights are threatened or even violated. Uh, so for civil society, NHRIs can be quite crucial allies. And notably, um, country visit reports by our conference of INGOs have shown what happens if this is not the case, when civil society feels abandoned on a number of issues. For example, just to mention one, the defense of LGBTI rights uh, in situations when H NHRIs do not dare to take sides because they are too concerned of the bad perception from other public authorities, especially in societies uh, where this may be less self-evident. Um, so, of course, in such a context, NHRIs are not automatically considered friends or allies by civil society. Um, and I think it's therefore quite important to re-emphasize this role for NHRIs uh, to prevent reprisals against civil society organizations um, but if they are not independent enough, they can at worst reinforce reprisals against civil society organizations and human rights defenders. And this may explain why, uh, according to a, a report um, by the Fundamental Rights Agency of the EU recently, um, it was uh, noted that all those, at least within the EU and NHRIs, were engaging with civil society, but not always the other way around. And this sometimes has to do with this concern of some parts of society that it is not always safe or beneficial to do so. And therefore, it's all the more important um, that NHRIs live up to the Paris principles fully and are truly independent and pluralist. And this is also what Berbo Koffler mentioned, uh, independent from other state institutions, but also independent from societal pressures and able to function what I could call bravely and without fear of repression themselves. 
Uh, and we know, of course, that this is unfortunately a problem uh, that in some countries, NHRIs, just like civil society organizations, face similar issues. Uh, and secondly, that NHRIs, of course, are pluralist in representing in their composition, in their networks, in their outlook, um, truly open and, and inclusive perspective. Uh, also, uh, towards less represented, less popular voices in society, in civil society. And that's exactly where they are needed the most, of course. So not just to echo the majority's opinion, but to respect the positions of minorities, which is basically how the European Court of Human Rights has phrased what a true democracy, a well-functioning democracy should be. Um, so when NHRIs live up to the Paris principles, then civil society can and will safely turn towards them. Um, so what role can civil society then play to ensure strong NHRIs? Uh, well, I think in several countries, first of all, the push to establish and create and strengthen NHRIs came from civil society. So for example, in my country, the Netherlands, uh, our institute, same at Utrecht University, together with the ombudsperson and others, were forming a coalition uh, over a decade ago to establish the Dutch National Human Rights Institution. And this has happened in many countries. So civil society, is often at the cradle of NHRIs, but also in many places has become part of advisory boards, uh, participated obviously in stakeholder meetings and helping thereby to decide, um, uh, helping NHRIs to decide which priorities, which human rights uh, strategic issues to take up. Um, and of course, civil society supports victims in countries where victims can bring complaints to NHRIs on, for example, about discrimination, um, or they can offer uh, a user-based perspective. If we think of the role that many NHRIs have under the UN Convention uh, for the Rights of People with Disabilities, um, they really bring that user-based perspective. So in a nutshell, uh, I don't think it's exaggerated to say that it's difficult to see how NHRIs could be strong and effective without a vibrant civil society. So as the conference of NGOs, we, we stated last December, civil society is crucial in helping to safeguard the council's core aims of democracy, rule of law and human rights. And we are very happy to work together with strong independent NHRIs on that. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, <clears throat> uh, Professor Bause. I think that was a clear description about the difficulties and opportunities which are there in the relationship between civil society and national human rights institutions you have pinpointed how much they can be partners, they can be helpful for civil society, how much civil society are contributing already to them, but also where are risks yeah, when they are not independent enough that they can be even reinforcing pressure on civil society in states. I think that is a good picture which remains us also why the Paris principles are so extremely important and uh, the independence of these institutions. Thanks for this uh, insight. Um, the next on our list is Christoph Poirel. And um, obviously the question for me to you would be, how can the Directorate for Human Rights um, contribute uh, to the goal of having strong and independent, as Mr. Baus just been pointing, national human rights institutions in place in each of the member states? Mr. Good morning. I hope you can hear and see me. Yes, we can. Very good, very good. Good morning. And first of all, I would like to thank Henry and the German chairmanship of the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe for organizing this uh, online meeting. I think it's a, an excellent and obviously very timely initiative. I'm very glad to see on the chat that uh, there are more than 200 participants, which shows the interest of people in this event. I, I must say I was also very interested to see the results of the poll that you have organized and to see that on all three questions that you asked, uh, there was a high percentage of participants that uh, um, underlined the, the, the value of the recommendation recently adopted by the Committee of Ministers from different perspectives. So for us, it's a it's a very rewarding in a way. Um, before perhaps I, I address your specific question, I would like to start by saying that obviously for the Council of Europe and for the intergovernmental sector in particular, uh, national human rights institutions are key partners and therefore in a way also targets of our activities. Um, 
they are key partners for, for, for what reason? Well, first of all, because they, they make a, a very valuable contribution, I must say, to the preparation, but also the dissemination and the implementation of the legal standards that are um, adopted by the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe. The most evident and eloquent example of the valuable contribution of a national human rights institutions to the preparation of instruments is the specific input of ENRI to the recommendation that is discussed uh, today. But there are many other examples of a, such a contribution. All our intergovernmental committees benefit from the contribution of a NGOs, representatives of civil society, either because they either because they participate as observers in the meeting of our committees, or because they make written contributions to our committees. And I think that without their input. It is quite likely, I would say, that a number of our instruments, if not all of them, will not be at the level where they are. Um, and secondly, as I said, their contribution is very important in terms of a dissemination and promotion of the implementation of the standards. The, the text that we prepare in the Council of Europe, be they conventions or recommendations, are meant to be living instruments, to be effectively applied and respected by our member states, not pieces of papers that uh, you put on the shelf and, and you forget about them. And, and from that perspective also, it's very important for us to rely on the support of national human rights institutions, other actors in civil society to, to, to contribute to this dissemination, this promotion, and sometimes also to remind member states about their duties to as parties to our conventions to effectively implement the standards of the convention. Mrs. Koffler referred to the importance that the German chairmanship attaches to the execution of the judgments of our court. This is one example, but there are many other instruments of the Council of Europe where we need also sometimes to remind member states of their duties. I take, for example, the case of the European Social Charter. You will have in the second panel the president of the uh, ECSR, the European Committee of Social Rights, Karin Lucas. Um, the European Social Charter is, is another example of a convention of the Council of Europe where member states sometimes, member states need to be reminded of their obligations. So that's the first input from a, those organizations. The second input is that, is on the other way, meaning that uh, national human rights institutions are very important for us because they refer to us concrete instances of violations or non-respect of human rights. They refer to as cases where there are precisely deficiencies in the implementations of the standards. And I, right at the beginning, the president of entry mentioned the launching of this new interactive tool on the execution of the judgments of our courts. I must say, I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased. It's, this is a very good initiative and, and we rely again heavily on national human rights institution to inform us about the state of implementation of the judgments of the court, not only the, the most prominent cases that Mrs. Koffler mentioned, but also other very important cases because they they concern uh, potentially a, a very large number of people. If I take, for example, the situation of detainees, the conditions of detention of people in prisons in our member states, I'm, I must say we have benefited from very good communications made by national human rights institution on the situation of detainees in prisons, including on questions, very important questions like access by prisoners to healthcare in prisons, which is a one concrete example of, of the matter. Um, and then also they contribute to the, um, the, the monitoring of the conclusions and recommendations of the monitoring bodies of the Council of Europe. Almost all our conventions now have so-called monitoring bodies that are attached to those conventions. And, and those monitoring bodies, again, rely heavily on the input of a non-state actors when they monitor the, the implementation of the, of the conventions. If I take the convention of the, the fight against trafficking in human beings, the convention on um, violence against violence against women, that was again mentioned by Mrs. Koffler. We rely primarily on reports that are submitted by the member states, the states parties to those conventions. But in addition to that, 
it's very important for us to have also the input of non-state actors, including national human rights institutions. So all that to say that, as I said, a NIH allies are very important partners for us. And as I said, because of that, they are also um, an important target group for us because it is very important that uh, those institutions can work, as you all said before, independently and effectively. So to that end, I will say we have a developed so-called cooperation programs. Um, unfortunately, so far, not in all member states of the Council of Europe, and that's my personal regret, but that is due to the lack of a sufficient financial resources to do so. But for instance, we have a organized activities to support national prevention mechanisms against torture and treatment in a number of Council of Europe member states, the, the famous NMPs, in, in particular in Eastern Europe and, and in Southeast Europe. Um, we have also supported the establishment of a equality bodies in certain of our member states like Moldova. We are supporting also um, national human rights institutions in uh, the advocacy role at national level in, um, in following the implementation of uh, domestic legislation through, for instance, uh, analytical tools that are developed by those institutions. So thanks to those cooperation program, we have been able to assist a number of uh, those institutions. As I said, we would like to do more, but uh, for that, we need more resources coming from our uh, member states. Um, a personal wish that I have would be that uh, we could extend those cooperation programs to all 47 member states because basically there is no reason anymore, in my opinion, and that's a personal opinion, not, a, not an official opinion, but in my personal opinion, there is not no reason anymore to continue to make a distinction between the Western countries and the Eastern countries. Our cooperation programs were designed after the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, but that was already a long time ago. And when you look at the human rights situation all over Europe, you realize that there are also deficiencies in terms of protection of human rights, including also in a European Union member state. So I hope that uh, one day, I don't know when exactly, but one day, and I will finish with that, we would be able to develop more transversal assistance program for national human rights institution all over, all over Europe. And with that, many thanks again. Thanks, Mr. Poirel, uh, for pinpointing how important national human rights institutions can be in following up what states do, in following up court uh, decisions, in following up the work of the social charter, and what all is can be helpful for you. Thanks for that, but also saying how you could maybe potentially and uh, actually you are already supporting national human rights institutions, not in all, but you like to do it in all countries. Um, thanks for that. Um, back to, to you, Ms. Kofla. You have now listened to the three speakers. What would you resume would be really important for the Council of Europe member states and also the Committee of Ministers to further implement that recommendation Yeah, after you have heard this? What are the key things you have heard? Well, thank you very much to all the other panelists and to you, Mr. Windfall. I was trying to take notes a little bit from what you were pointing out as important uh, steps. Um, I first would say uh, the idea or the, the idea of the Parliament Assembly, which was presented also by Lord Balf on the question of uh, regular reports on the situation and activities on ombudsman's institution and the networking idea, how we closer can work together and support each other and take in recognition the differences in the various countries and uh, the, the uh, really build up a network system is one of the important uh, moments I heard in that uh, um, debate. Um, I found also very interesting um, that Mr. Bowser was pointing out the role of civil society, and that is crucial how we really can uh, support civil society and how national human rights institutions are working together with uh, civil society or where pressure is uh, and which role could then be uh, another engagement of our national human rights institutions. And um, Mr. Porel was pointing out that national human rights institutions have the role to sometimes 
push member states and push them in the right direction and remember them on their duties and also have the duty to um, support and assist member states in building up really uh, based on the Paris principles, uh, institutes, national institutes on human rights. And if I resume that and then have those three pillars and those three uh, points to refer on, I would say those are the things we have to work on and we have to work on closely and we have to any time uh, organize a process where we also evaluate where we are standing and then looking at, at the points which are missing and where we can do better. And that's something I would wish the uh, Committee of Ministers to do first, the, to organize a process of permanent evaluation and working on the gaps we still uh, then identify. So, and the other thing is, of course, what the uh, Committee of Ministers always can do is to raise awareness. Of course, uh, ministers have an, uh, uh, a greater uh, possibility uh, to point out the importance of uh, national human rights institutions to societies and to show societies where there is really, really uh, important role and the important input national human rights institutes can give. So this question on raising awareness and uh, having visibility um, uh, for all this work which is done, um, and also with uh, the work which is done on, on, on the other institutes of the Council of Europe, uh, which was pointed out also, um, I think that should be more uh, publicly discussed and more publicly shown. Well, and uh, as I was just pointing out, um, um, acting in building up reliable networks and assisting where it is necessary in all member states it's one of the uh, great roles uh, the Committee of Ministers can also um, give a push in that direction. I stop here because I'm always then the one who is too talkative and <laughs> I, I hope we have time for coming to questions yeah. and answers also. Yes, well, we will have, but uh, one of the uh, recommendations or conditions in order to have questions and answers then would be that for my next question, you all answer briefly yeah so that would be very helpful then we can open up the floor after this but um, i would like to come back to the situation uh, that um, national human rights institutions are increasingly challenging also um, interference with their interdependence and also their effective functioning and there's often a threat to uh, the some of these institutions or maybe even to the persons involved to this and maybe we can have a next round discussing this with brief answers. I, I might stay with Christoph Borrell. Can you briefly explain the Council of Europe mechanism in place to address reprisals against human rights defenders uh, because of their engagement with the Council of Europe and how national human rights institutions and other human rights defenders can access that mechanism in practice? Mr. Borrell. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Renfro. Well, there are several council of bodies that can uh, have a role in that respect. I will, uh, I will not mention the parliamentary assembly since Mr. Balfour will uh, certainly mention the role of the parliamentary assembly. Um, but uh, there is the possibility, for example, to a uh, human rights defenders and representatives of a national human rights institutions to to raise their concerns regarding their situation. For example, with our human rights commissioner, um, and then the commissioner may decide if she wants to uh, raise the question, uh, the, the, refer to the problems raised by these people to the national authorities of the country concerned in order to ask the authorities what they intend to do in order to uh, uh, first of all, clarify the situation if need be, and secondly, if it appears that indeed there has been a, um, uh, a, a problem to ask the authorities what they intend to do in order to remedy the problem. So that's a possible first course of action. If I understand, you will have the commissioner later in the second panel, so perhaps the commissioner may want to say more on that. The second procedure that exists is the so-called procedure for investigating um, alleged reprisals against uh, human rights defenders um, as a consequence of their interaction with the Council of Europe. Over, the, over time, we noted that there were uh, some instances where NGOs 
ombudspersons working with us were the subject of uh, harassment and uh, um, difficulties of any kind uh, in the, because they have been working with the Council of Europe, because they have been working, reporting to the Council of Europe instances of human rights violations. And of course, that is something that is not acceptable. We cannot accept that our member states, the governments of our member states put pressure on representatives of the national human rights institutions and other human rights defenders to prevent them from doing their job. I mean, also journalists, for instance, who in a way also human rights defenders. So because of that, it was decided in 2018 to establish a specific procedure, which is in the hand of our Secretary General this time, not the Commissioner, but the Secretary General. So far, we have 12 instances of where specific situations were referred to the Secretary General with a request to, to follow up those complaints. Um, I must say there are a number of conditions that the Secretary General has decided to, to, to list in order to initiate a, a dialogue with the government. Uh, the first one being to, to establish that there is a, a link between the, the incident that has been noticed and the, and the activities of the human rights defender. So there needs to be a clear link between the the problem that has been faced by a person and an institution, and the fact that that person and institution was working with the Council of Europe. And secondly, the, 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 there is also, of course, there is a need to, to establish that the information that has been received is credible, is reliable, that it's not only allegations, uh, that the language that is used uh, is also not offensive, uh, I think national human rights institution and human rights defenders can defend their case without using uh, offensive language or on untrue information. But with those provisos, as long as those conditions are met, the Secretary General may decide to um, uh, enter into contact with the government concerned and ask the government concerned to, to provide information and to explain what steps the government intends to take to, to remedy the situation. And finally, of course, there is the possibility for anyone who considers that his or her rights have been violated to address a petition to our court in Strasbourg to lodge an application before the court. Um, um, and, and, and if I make that use that opportunity to inform all participants today that Protocol 15 to the Human Rights Convention will enter into force on the 1st of a August of this year, following the last ratification of the protocol uh, this month, um, which means uh, that in particular, and, uh, and one may regret that, but it's the the, the consequence of the entry into force of the protocol, which means that the, the period within which people can lodge an application before the court will now be reduced from six months to four months. So I think it's, it's very important that all the participants in the meeting today, representative of national human rights institutions, are aware of this change. I don't think it will affect much in substance applications that are submitted by individuals to the court because four months is still a rather reasonable period a period to submit an application for individuals. It might be more complicated for the so-called interstate cases, but I, I just wanted to flag that information to all of you um, because I think it's a it's in a, a, an important development to know. And thank you, I've been too long, sorry for that. <laughs> Yes, maybe a bit too long, but thanks for uh, explaining the opportunities which are there with the Commissioner, with the Secretary General and with the Court. I think that was very helpful. Um, just to uh, indicate that if you follow the chat also parallel, you see some interesting responses from Alan Mitchell, the President of the CPT, from Pet Petra Wille from the Norwegian Institute for Human Rights. You find something about the uh, ENRI mechanism for NSAEs at risk. So uh, follow this. I can't uh, go into all these uh, comments at the, uh, at the chat in details because then we are missing the time. Let's go now to um, Lord Balf. Which mechanism or processes are available for the parliamentary assembly you see that could support national human rights institutions and other human rights defenders when facing challenges of their independence and effective functioning? Mm. What do you think? I think that the most useful thing that we can do 
is to follow through on things. The weakness of the Parliamentary Assembly is that we often produce reports, we have debates, we pass resolutions, and then the caravan moves on and we forget the resolution and we don't follow things up. But there is a structure within the Council of Europe of having a permanent rapporteur. For instance, we have a permanent rapporteur on the implementation of the judgments of the Court of Human Rights. And I think probably one of the most positive things that could come out of today's conference in Council of Europe terms, which I'm willing to take back to the Legal Affairs Committee, is the suggestion that we should at least say for two or three years as an experiment, have a permanent rapporteur on the Ombudsman services. And the job of the rapporteur, clearly you can't go around 40 odd countries, but the job of the rapporteur would be in working with the administration to look at any points that are made to the Council of Europe of areas where the Paris, Venice and our principles are not being followed. In other words, where um, ombudspersons are being put under extreme pressure or not being listened to or are having their budgets cut, that there is some sort of mechanism where the Council of Europe can follow up on whether or not its principles are being adopted. Now, this could be done by individual resolution, but that would be invidious because then you'd be saying, well, shall we have an individual resolution on one particular country or on another. So the fairest way of doing it would be to have a permanent rapporteur appointed. And uh, I would probably suggest that, but you know, you don't want permanent rapporteurs that don't work. So I'll suggest that we appoint one say for two or three years and we then evaluate as to whether it's making a positive contribution to the work of ombudspersons in Europe. I think that's probably the most useful thing that the PACE can do. But there may be others. I'm here, I'm listening, and I'm taking things back. I'm not only speaking to you, I'm listening to you. And whatever is said is being carefully noted. Thanks, Lord Ball, for this uh, quite interesting proposal you made. And we have to think about this in the follow-up of this meeting. I think such a permanent rapporteur could be really an interesting a, a task also for taking care of maybe situations where actors, ombudspersons or national human rights institutions come under pressure. I would like to continue with Antoine uh, Bause. Um, sadly, national human rights institutions, civil society organizations and individual human rights defenders increase uh, or face increasing challenges to carry out their work in some of the council of member states all together so each of these groups can face these problems how can the situation be better addressed according to the conference of ingos what are your main demands uh, mr bowser thank you uh, we also come to listen not to have demands but um, i think <laughs> first of all important to, to acknowledge that this these pressures that human rights defenders and civil society faces is part of a quite global trend and that we see these same pressures on uh, independent critical voices within state institutions of which NHRIs are a very good example and in some other countries as well, the judiciary. And this is under pressure in, in many places um, and therefore requires quite a coordinated approach to counter it. Um, for example, in, in the work that I do in the uh, NGO Law Expert Council, which supports the conference of INGOs, we unfortunately very regularly have to conclude that new laws or amendments to laws relating to NGOs are contrary to the European Convention of Human Rights. Um, and to protect these freedoms of assembly, association, expression um, in each Council of Europe member state, it's crucial that civil society has supportive allies, avenues also to remedy wrongs and partners to share concerns with and information. Uh, in those very NHRIs. So again, this, this partnership is quite important. And as I said before, the, the more independent they are, the better to fulfill these crucial roles. And I think this is why this new recommendations um, 
is so important because in its title, it doesn't just uh, mention developing NHRIs, but also strengthening them. And it was mentioned before. And only then can the NHRIs truly, um, as, as, is, as the recommendation phrases it, communicate and cooperate with all the civil society stakeholders, in particular, also human rights defenders and organizations uh, that are under threat. And we should enjoy easy and safe access, and I emphasize this, easy and safe access, as the recommendation calls it, to NHRIs as part of an enabling environment. Um, so this very much connects to the earlier Committee of Ministers recommendation on civil society space of 2018. Um, but it also means enabling NHRIs to work freely and independently together with civil society and vice versa. And there, uh, NHRIs can only speak out freely about the problems faced by civil society if they have a strong mandate by law, uh, if they can function in a factually independent way, and if they themselves are free and safe to speak out. Um, so there are some parallel pressures, um, but you're also, um, the more uh, NHRIs in practical terms are able to issue statements of concern, uh, solidarity or support when individual human rights defenders or organizations face dangers or threats, um, then the more often also uh, one can see that civil society organizations will stand in stronger solidarity when, with these NHRIs when they need support. Um, so it's quite important to build this in the long term, and this is in parallel to what Lord Balfe mentioned about long term memory in, in pace. You're also a long term practice in Council of Europe member states um, to also uh, have a role for NHRIs to help human rights defenders and vice versa. And I, I know this is also part of the ENRI's regional action plan on human rights defenders. So I, I think that's a very important point. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Baus, also for pinpointing the two directions. <laughs> Support of national human rights institutions is possible, but also both are threatened and that needs to be seen together. Thanks. Maybe let's us close the second panel by asking Ms. Kofler. Uh, the Parliamentary Assembly resolution has suggested that the Committee of Members should react to threats of ombuds institutions. Has the Committee of Ministers so far reacted to the threats faced by human rights defenders? Do you consider, in the light of the recently adopted recommendation on civil society space, ombuds institution, national human rights institutions, that uh, uh, the co uh, committee of uh, ministers should install such a practice? I could be very brief and say yes and yes, but a little <laughs> bit more, I would like to extend that. Yes, I think that is a very useful resolution, the Parliament, uh, Parliamentary Assembly, um, was coming up with and yes i think really the uh, committee of ministers should use that resolution also for uh, seeing that as a support of their further work and working um with that resolution and in the light of that resolution um and yes i think that can be very useful in addressing um for example the threats ombuds institutions are facing every time um, and maybe also with uh, what we debated in the first round and uh, what Lord Balfour was pointing out and having a regular mechanism then which could also be somehow used uh, um, to give the committee of ministers this push to really regularly um, yeah, um, speak out and address uh, the threats, uh, various civil society organizations, human rights institutes and uh, ombuds institutions are facing. And yes, they have um, pointed out at several uh, occasions in the regular meetings, for example, of the minister's deputies in Strasbourg last time, uh, the situation on human rights defenders in, in Russia and Turkey. We were debating that today already. Um, also, um, in the monitoring of the execution of the judgments of the European Court on Human Rights that was pointed out by the committee of the uh, ministers, uh, the, the cases I, meant, I mentioned before, Kavala, Demirtas, uh, Navalny, but also if you think on human rights defenders in Azerbaijan, for example, the case of uh, Mamad Lee. So there are many cases where the committee of ministers can uh, point out, did point out, and I think that's an instrument which should be used more often and regularly in a, a way to really come into a, 
uh, a high level debate on human rights defenders and the way how we can protect them and also the institutions. Thanks a lot. <clears throat> Thanks a lot for these clear words. Uh, we had planned to have a third round of questions, but we are run out. Uh, we are a bit short in time. The third level would have been to ask, what do you think are the roles national human rights institutions can play in the Council of Europe institutions? Fortunately, we have already heard a lot from Christoph Poirel, from Richard Balf on this. Maybe I just uh, squeeze that third round of question to one question to Antoine Baus. Um, differently to national human rights institutions, INGOs have a participatory status at the Council of Europe. And what is according to you the relevance and the added value of this participatory status of INGOs and how does this facilitate also national implementation of council results? And do you believe it would be valuable for ENRI or national human rights institutions to be accorded a guaranteed participation status independent from state governments or at the Council of Europe? What, what do you think? Short answer also, yes. <laughs> <laughs> What it means uh, for INGOs to have this, this status at the Council of Europe is literally a place at the table, just like in the negotiations leading up to this recommendation, um, and also voicing um, the interests, concerns, and perspectives of the different constituencies of all those NGOs. And I think that is this giving a voice of a podium is quite important to have that access in a structural way. Um, we see that in at the United Nations, this exists as well, but it is under pressure there. And I think the Council of Europe should really cherish this quite special openness to uh, NGOs. Uh, and maybe the parallel for NHRIs, why I think it would be very valuable there to have a similar thing, is that these international NGOs very often have branches and sections in Council of Europe member states from which they can collect cross data cross country information, um, feed that into the Council of Europe, all these institutions, and vice versa also um, raise awareness of the existing possibilities uh, to address different Council of Europe institutions that were, were mentioned by Christoph, for example, um, where they can turn to. So there, this, this is also a conduit, a two-way conduit, which this role of having the special status enables. And I think in parallel, for example, ENRI as, as the, the umbrella organization of all the NHRIs would be very useful for them to have a similar role in, in that sense. So a place at the table and a conduit for information as an awareness two ways. Thanks. So we at least collect some of the ideas which we hear today, a permanent representative, maybe a status. <clears throat> so some things to follow up after this session. Thanks really for that. Um, just to explain to you what would be the next step. We have already gathered several questions. I have carefully noted what I see in the chat. But we have also said at the beginning, let's first have two uh, heads of national human rights institutions responding to what we have heard. And then we open up for the questions and answers, uh, the questions we have received and give you all the chance to answer to these questions. That would be the next step. So two small interventions now from uh, in the heads of national human rights institutions. And uh, the first one will be Arman Tatoyan, the head of the Armenian national human rights institution. You have the floor, please. Hello, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for uh, providing the, the floor to me. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, and I, uh, I greet all, uh, all our colleagues here, all distinguished colleagues, and, um, and I have to appreciate Henry and German Championship for organizing this event. I will try to be as short as possible. NHRIs have a tremendous role in implementation of uh, the uh, European human rights system and shaping the legal system, uh, sorry, the implementation of European human rights system and shaping the legal system of the country. And I will now list uh, several points that I think are very important and sh to show how is the implementation should, can take place. Well, first of all, this is, these are the recommendations submitted to governments and different local authorities based on European human rights uh, standards and uh, for example the uh, European um, the human rights defender of Armenia has published 
compilation of legal standards based on the rights of uh, related to the rights of uh, prisoners and detainees. And these are basically based on European human rights st standards and especially the standards of the CPT, which are very important for us. Awareness raising, the second is awareness raising of different human rights issues based on European human rights standards. And um, first very important uh, example is the, the chatbot, which was installed and created by the Human Rights Defenders Office. Uh, with international partners, UN assistance, but it is also based basically on uh, international standards and among them CPT is, has crucial role. Uh, of course, awareness raising campaigns such as video uh, campaigns, uh, large campaigns are very important, which are based on European standards and aimed at breaking stereotypes, uh, which is again very important. Uh, another very important issue is the uh, the point is assessing the implementation, state of implementation by the government, European human rights standards. Here I want to bring just um, two examples. Well, first is the, uh, the, the main um, example is submit, submission of uh, Rule 9 uh, submissions to the Committee of Ministers on the implementation of the European Court of Human Rights Judgment. So we submit them to the uh, Director General of the Human Rights and uh, Rule of Law of the Council of Europe, and with the relevant co execution division, we have excellent cooperation. We assess the implementation, and this is kind of becoming kind of uh, uh, control, form of control over the government because we have this we have this experience when the Ministry of Defence was not implementing our recommendation, then we could through Council of Europe make sure show to the Ministry of Defence that uh, this is this has great importance and. Very importantly, we do it also with in jointly with NGOs. So this is the initiative of the Human Rights Defender of Armenia. We make our submissions uh, in cooperation with NGOs. And um, I have to say that uh, another important step is submitting uh, third party interventions to the European Court of Human Rights. And this is another very important step. By this, we, sh we provide the European Court of Human Rights accurate facts about the concrete case. We monitor all the communications and we, I think, uh, information provided by us to the European Court of Human Rights helps the court deliver judgments and deliver stand legal standards that, are, that reflect the real facts. And we had already these kind of cases. Uh, I want to appreciate our cooperation with the CPT. And uh, I want to underline the high importance of the CPT because we submit also our uh, results of our monitoring to the CPT. For NHRIs, I think very important to provide always objective information to international partners to not to lose the credibility and the reputation. Uh, another example of cooperation is the co direct cooperation with international organizations. And I will bring here two examples. For example, uh, we have excellent cooperation with PACE, with the monitoring with the Secretariat, and for example, with the Venice Commission, in case of uh, problematic situations, challenges, or just consultation, we have direct contact just through even picking up the phone and discussing important questions with our colleagues. I, co I would call all these points a subsidiary role of the human rights defender in implementing human European human rights standards at national level. And of course, all of these problems, all of these issues, then later we gather and we start implementing projects with Council of Europe, for example, and we have this kind of project with DG1, as Mr. Poirel very uh, rightly mentioned, several mm -hmm. important directions, and of, with DG2, etc. And lastly, I, I would like to focus my attention on the uh, ENRI, uh, the European Network of National Human Rights Inst Institution. I, we consider it as uh, one of very few centers of ex excellences, uh, which help us very greatly in our work. First of all, it is a, a, a amazing, very important platform for ex exchange of expertise, uh, for getting advice and for implementing joint programs. And of course, this is also very important to exchange for exchange for the purposes of exchange of experience among other NHRIs, because the, we also establish relations also thanks to these kind of platforms. And as was very rightly mentioned, uh, direct cooperation with our colleagues is, is very important. 
And uh, I think uh, the important thing also is institutional capacities of ENRI, because for me, as the human rights defender of Armenia, as the head of NHRI, institutional strong ENRI is very important because, uh, because then we have uh, reciprocally, re re reciprocal uh, assistance from ENRI when we uh, face certain challenges. And of course, I highly value institutional <laughs> representation of ENRI. Uh, in uh, different international organizations, such as, such as in CDDH, because everything is inter in interconnected uh, principle. When we provide specific information to ENRI based on national experience, then the same is by ENRI, and then everything is presented uh, to international organizations. And for example, in, I know that in CDDH, ENRI has great importance, uh, the, in, especially through participation of the uh, Secretary General, the head, and this gives us then the feedback to improve the work that we implement here at national level. So on, with this, I want to just finalize my uh, intervention and want to thank specifically all European human rights institutions because you make us uh, stronger and I think NHRI should provide, uh, should always uh, provide uh, the, the, the very accurate and objective information to international partners and then start cooperating with them towards implementation at the national level. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Mr. Tatoyan. I think for this impressive overview, where the Council of Europe can be very helpful for your work, <laughs> uh, how you can really use the institutions, and on the other side, what type of information you can provide to the institutions of the Council of Europe uh, to be really able to look into the situation in your country, in Armenia. I think that was very uh, uh, insightful. The next would be uh, speaking now would be Sirpa Rautziu, the head of the Finnish National Human Rights Institution. Sirpa, you have the floor. Hello, and, and dear colleagues, uh, it's a real pleasure to be able to address this, uh, this really important uh, event, even if briefly. Um, I'm the director of the Human Rights Center, uh, and, and together with the Finnish Parliament Ombudsman from the Finnish National Human Rights Center. So we are we are the peculiar national human rights. May, sorry, Sip. Sip. Does have yeah. a, a benefit as well, Sip. lead the project and, and many May I ask you to switch off maybe your uh, camera because you are very difficult to hear? That could be helpful. Yeah. I will try. Okay. Is it any better now? Yeah, it's much better now. Thanks. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, I will not repeat. I was just uh, introducing myself. Uh, as a background, I, I have been uh, uh, dealing with Council of Europe and even working for Council of Europe but a very long time. Uh, I think some 13 years ago with the Commissioner for Human Rights Office and also have um, worked with ENRI, supported ENRI, and benefited from ENRI since the Finnish Human Rights Center was set up some uh, in 2012, almost 10 years ago. I'm very pleased to see this uh, progress and, and this high-level meeting happening. It's really a, a groundbreaking breaking event, I think, for national human rights institutions and the Council of Europe. And I was happy to see that we're dealing both with the Council of Europe level, the intergovernmental and oversight, as well as the national level, because obviously these are interconnected. Uh, my guess is that the overlay mechanisms are better known for most of the NHRIs, so also very important to hear about the intergovernmental processes uh, that, that uh, might be available for NHRIs and, and are uh, often collectively uh, taken part of uh, by ENRI. I'll offer brief comments to each of the uh, speaker, so we'll not uh, repeat what my colleague Arman has said, because obviously our experiences are similar despite the, the very different setting we are coming from. Uh, so for the um, uh, director uh, from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Krista Oinonen, I would first of all like to thank you for the tremendous work that you have been doing for these uh, recommendations. Uh, this was already mentioned, uh, but also for your national work on, on promoting uh, national human rights institutions. I think you are one of the most ardent uh, supporters of national human rights institutions, always keeping us in mind and also clearly understanding the role, which not everybody uh, does, even in Finland. So thank you very much. 
I was particularly happy uh, to see how clearly the new recommendation states the uh, independence, uh, especially the legal and the financial aspects of the independence, uh, are not often uh, fully fully guaranteed uh, in, in, in all member states. Uh, uh, even in Finland, often uh, independence is seen as operational independence. So bodies attached to ministries are, are declared uh, in fully independent even when in fact they are only operationally independent. So this is one of the aspects that, that uh, why we welcome this new recommendation uh, from the Council of Europe. Also the legal basis, uh, the preference for constitutional is, is very important. So for the um, uh, German uh, government commissioner, uh, uh, Mrs. Köpfel, I would like to very much thank you for, for raising the the importance of national human rights institutions as a rule of law institutions, uh, once providing checks and balances uh, uh, for, for government action and keeping up the rule of law principle. This has not been perhaps as well recognized uh, as the role in, in promoting and protecting human rights. Uh, but in the last few years, this has really become a major issue. And, and also, uh, I think most of us have been trying to respond to this challenge. Uh, uh, also with the help of ENRI and, and uh, international organizations such as Council of Europe. I would also like to say that uh, the Finnish and German Institute enjoy a very good uh, cooperation, I would say even friendship, with, with many of, of the colleagues there. And, and we have benefited from, from their a uh, little bit longer experience. I know you are 20 now, Michael, we will be 10 next year, and we've learned a great deal from you. And in particular, we are looking very carefully at the moment how you are developing your monitoring work. And, and I'm, I'm very pleased to, 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 to hear and understand that, that you have been given uh, more monitoring mandates and resources, and that there's a discussion going on that you would become the, the monitoring body for Istanbul Convention, and I think also the Trafficking Con Convention. I wish our government would understand the same, that the monitoring should be more centralized because the independence there is crucial but it's also about knowledge, understanding human rights methodologies. Uh, so you cannot spread monitoring all over the place. Uh, um, so it, it should be uh, made stronger. So, so we will be definitely looking, looking at this model very carefully. Then for the uh, Lord above from PACE, uh, you mainly talked about the Ombuds institutions, uh, uh, but obviously uh, some, some of them are also national human rights institutions and we are a hybrid. I think uh, there is already a good established uh, cooperation, but I do believe that PACE is not always at the radar of national human rights institutions. And I think it would be important to strengthen that, and not least because of the link it provides to the national parliaments uh, uh, through the delegations. Uh, so, so something that we can, we can uh, certainly do more of. Uh, then to the uh, Dutch colleague, Antoine Weiss, I apologize for probably saying all the names wrong. I totally agree with the importance of working uh, very closely as allies with, with civil society in a strategic way. And uh, there we, we, we are very fortunate to have many excellent uh, civil society organizations that we work with. Some of our members in our pluralistic body, but we also work with them on monitoring, trying to make sure that it is done in a strategic way. And in fact, next week we will have an event on one of the one of the treaty bodies together with the main human rights NGO. So we have a good, good cooperation, but we also have very uh, different roles sometimes. Uh, NGOs are working on one issue often, while we must have a broad, broad mandate and work on, 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 on many issues, not to detriment of any others. Uh, then to Mr. Poirel from the Council of Europe. Uh, thank you for mentioning the, the role of NHRIs in monitoring. And, and the importance of independence and also effecting, effectiveness. You mentioned the cooperation programs and you would like to have them in all countries. I believe Finland does not have, have any uh, cooperation programs. I could be wrong, but I, I think we still use the tools that you provide uh, very actively. Definitely at the Human Rights Center, we are using help, help the legal training tools Venice Commission checklist, the uh, courts, human rights fact sheet, et cetera. Uh, and also more and more good communication tools, I, I, I should add. Uh, but I would welcome obviously more, more programmatic cooperation. And I should mention here that uh, Finland has quite recently set up a new rule of law center uh, with the funding from the government. 
uh, it's uh, actually being set up now. And I think there could be one very useful uh, cooperation uh, partnership uh, with the Council of Europe with its strong human rights based approach to programming and, and rule of law work. This I would, it's not with the Human Rights Center, but we will be working also closely with the Rule of Law Center. And um, okay. finally, my final comment is that the Council of Europe, of course, is the main rule of law organization in Europe, also for human rights protection. And therefore, I think the cooperation between uh, NHRI's Council of Europe, absolutely vital at all levels. Uh, it's you know, interconnected and it should be continuous. Thank you very much for, for this excellent event. Thanks, Sirpa, also for these uh, direct reactions to what you have heard from all the panelists and um, uh, showing what maybe options are there for national human rights institutions to improve their work, but also how important is it for us to really relate more strongly to the main institution for the rule of law, as you have said, which is the Council of Europe in our context. Thanks so much. Um, we have now uh, the question and answer section and three people has deliberately asked for the floor. The first two I would like to ask are those who are in the process of or in the wish to develop a full-fledged national human rights institutions. And we got uh, first Matthias Hui from Switzerland who is uh, maybe asking one question on the situation of Switzerland of establishing a national human rights institution. And then we will have Fernando Laiola from Italy, who will uh, speak on the same situation in Italy. Uh, Mr. Hui, maybe you can just uh, take the floor for a brief question to our panelists. Thank you very much, Mr. Windfur. Uh, welcome to everybody. Thank you very much for this very interesting discussion this morning. Uh, Switzerland is now in the making of uh, a national human rights institution, finally, after a very long battle and uh, the situation in Sweden or in Italy is, is quite similar. Now, my question is to, um, to the uh, Council of Europe institutions, as well as to, to representatives of member states or also other national human rights institutions. Uh, how can you conc very concretely this year contribute to, uh, to the push to the establishment of a national human rights institution in our countries uh, and the human rights institution with a full understanding of the of the Paris principles. Thanks, thanks, uh, Mr. Hui. And uh, I think with a similar or the same, let's say, question, we have uh, uh, Fernando Laiola with us from Italy. Uh, you have the floor, Mr. Laiola. Yes, thank you very much. Actually, I have the same question with re referring to Italy because uh, the parliament is stalling from 2018 and we are, we, they are discussing a, a bylaw on the, the setting up of a national human rights institution in Italy, but actually uh, this bylaw has never been pre presented in front of the full assembly. It is now uh, only uh, discussed before um, the relevant and the competent um, commission uh, of the parliament, which is the Commission for uh, Institutional Affairs. So my question uh, was more or less the same. So how can the Council of Europe or, or the Commissioner for Human Rights of the Council of Europe can help uh, the Italian parliament in, in passing the law or in speeding up the procedure? And by saying help, uh, in my mind, I say, how can they push the Italian parliament in speeding up the procedure? Thank you. Thanks for, for explaining us the difference between help and push, <laughs> or the maybe closely linked situation between the two. Uh, and as a third speaker, we have uh, Ambassador Dr. Mohamed Khan from the International Human Rights Commission from New York, who has asked for the floor. Mr. Khan, you have the floor. We can't hear you yet. You have to unmute. Thank you very much, Michael. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Michael. It's so kind of you, and uh, uh, I was, it was an amazing uh, to hear uh, from Ms. Koffler and uh, Mr. Boyce and Mr. Uh, Christophe and uh, Lord Bassett. I mean, it was a very good interactive uh, talks and informative talk which has been given to the international community by the NRI, and I appreciate the role of NRI to strengthen the 
and national institutions, uh, human rights institution into every country. The most important question is in front of the international community is that, that the Council of Europe and the European Union Today, uh, wherever we will be find the international institution, the problem is, uh, most important problem is the appointing the commissioners of every international, uh, in, into the national uh, institutions. Without the freedom and independence and the, uh, the, the status uh, of appointment of our NRI's members or the commissioners, uh, will be jeopardize all the work of, of freedom and independence of the NRI. What sort of the uh, recommendation uh, and uh, what sort of the roadmap has been uh, uh, made by the Council of Europe uh, towards the appointment of those uh, uh, members of the NRIs uh, which can lead the, uh, the independence, freedom and strengthening the role of NRIs into the Europe. And so that that model can also be uh, uh, fruitful for the other nation out of the Europe as well to uh, follow the, uh, the structure, implementation and strengthening the work of the NRIs. Thank you very much for all of, our, all of you. And uh, I hope my question is in a very uh, different from everyone. But it is a most important. When okay. we want to strengthen yeah. the NRI's work, we have to make the transparency of their appointment of that members as well, those who can judge the national institution for their violation and for their misconduct and for their uh, uh, all uh, uh, practice, which is the against the, uh, the European Convention and the special, especially the European Convention on Human Rights as well. So Thanks. this is uh, my question. Thank you very much and God bless all of you and I am listening here. Thanks, Dr. Khan, also for highlighting the importance of uh, the appointment of commissioners and uh, staff working in that institutions. So now we have uh, four minutes left or maybe eight minutes left. So that means for each of the four panelists, we have two minutes. Yeah, so <laughs> you can say yes, but you can also explain a bit more. But please uh, feel strictly limited to maybe two or two and a half maximum minutes yeah, so that we can hand over in time to the second panel. And I would like to start again with uh, Lord Balf, please. Well, thank you. I think we have to realize the limitations of the Council of Europe. We can give advice, we can help, and we can talk, but we don't have any power. And our only power is the power of a good example. And within Europe, there are certain common values. And I think we can, uh, to an extent, help and certainly things like having a permanent rapporteur on uh, NRIs and on uh, ombuds people would be of aid to them. But we also have to be quite clear about what the limitations of our power are. And our power is basically the power of a good example and to bring attention of, let's say, the backsliders to the procedures that go on in the better of the countries that we deal with. We can't, in answer to our Italian colleague, we can't make your parliament do anything. You know, all we can do is smile at it and say, you know, come along. It is a great blot on the reputation of Europe that the three countries that have the worst uh, record of implementing court decisions are Russia, well, you'd expect that, Turkey, well, they've always been difficult, and Italy. You know, there's a lot to sort out there, colleague. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Uh, the next would be Christophe Poirel. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, in, in answer to the questions put by the representatives of uh, Switzerland and Italy, I must say, the, the, the recommendation is a non-binding instrument. So legally speaking, it's not binding on our member states. So there is no way we can a, require our member states to implement the recommendation and set up a, a national human rights institution as such. But that being said, in the context of our uh, diplomatic context and dialogue with national authorities, we, we, we can and we will certainly encourage the authorities of the, of the two countries that were mentioned to 
to do so and establish uh, an independent uh, human rights uh, institution. Um, I must say Italy is going to take over the chairmanship of the Committee of Ministers in November. So I think it would be a, a, a good sign to, for, to start the chairmanship that Italy would, uh, would finally adopt the law on the, on the establishment of the, of the institution. Perhaps just to say on, your, on the question of the interaction with, with Henry, we are very happy with our we are very close cooperation with Henry, in particular in the context of the execution of the court judgments. If I may mention two points very briefly, we are going to, following the ministerial se uh, session that was held in Helsinki two years ago, we are going to establish a, a special portal accessible to everyone, where everyone, including national human rights institutions and NGOs, will have access to, in a more coherent manner, I would say, to all the work that is done by the intergovernmental bodies. And we will also publish an online calendar with all meetings of our governmental committees, with the names of secretaries to the committees, so that will hopefully facilitate the interaction with uh, human rights institutions and, uh, and NGOs. I remember I was in uh, Brussels two years ago and had a, a question from Anna Mashinska from the Polish Ombudsman's Office about what we were planning to do. So I'm pleased to tell in particular Anna that this is now the way and that will uh, become operational within a couple of months now. And, and with that, many thanks again for your invitation. I found this event extremely good and extremely useful. Thanks, Christoph. Professor Bausen, you have the floor. What are your answers? Thank you. And my answer would be really to use indeed this momentum of this recommendation uh, for Switzerland and Italy, for those who are in favor of it, to push those institutions to adopt those laws and to implement them. Uh, and there also to learn from how other countries did it. Um, Henry has just posted in the chat uh, uh, the link to their website on, on the whole body of advice and experience they have developed on setting them up. And I would here again emphasize in many countries, these institutions have come about because of coalitions, pushes from civil society in combination with some state institutions together um, in various constellations. And this is very important. It doesn't start from scratch. Uh, so even when they are set up, even if it would work out in Italy and Switzerland, which I really hope, then there's a lot of knowledge in society, in organizations, in academia that you can make use of. Uh, and especially in, in complicated, like confederational setups like in Switzerland or with the regions in Italy, um, do know that it's then crucial to have central knowledge hubs as an NHRI to support all those civil servants at those uh, sub-regional levels to uh, do the work. Uh, and that, I think, is one of the cru crucial lessons we have learned um, from earlier experiences in other countries. So use the momentum and really start to be the, what I've called earlier, the, the ears and arms of the Strasbourg system in all these countries. That's, that's quite a crucial role. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks for this uh, picture, the ears and arms. Uh, last, again, but not least, is uh, now uh, Ms. Kofler. Any recommendations for Switzerland and Italy <laughs> just in front of taking over the committee of ministers role? <laughs> no, just it. It's always challenging to give advice to other countries <laughs> because of course everybody has its own uh, settings. Um, well, I'm parliamentarian, that's my main job. So maybe there is a possibility of having a closer exchange with both parliaments, parliamentarians on that topic. We had the debate on um, the law um, for our Human Rights Institute in the German Parliament already. We had an intense debate uh, together with the Human Rights Institute and, and in civil society. So if that is wished, of course, uh, we have friendship groups in between parliamentarians in between Italy and uh, Germany and the same with Switzerland. That might be a, a useful tool for exchanging experiences. We have a committee on human rights in the German Bundestag, and I'm sure there are parliamentarians from, from all parliamentary groups in. I'm sure they are more than happy to get into a debate with uh, colleagues from uh, the Italian or the Swiss uh, parliament to debate on that. Um, 
that's on, on the whole question of, of lawmaking, that might be an, a, a possibility of exchange. I'm sure the institutes itself uh, are in close cooperation because I want to underline, I don't want to interfere in um, the building up of the institute, which should be independent. So that is uh, something tricky. Um, maybe I have a wish on, on both countries because um, I'm a commissioner on human rights here in Germany. And we have various European countries, EU members and non-EU members uh, who have appointed ambassadors on human rights in their governments. And unfortunately, I didn't uh, come close to a commissioner from Switzerland or Italy. Uh, it seems that they are not uh, established at the moment. If there's any possibility to suggest that, I think that would be a great idea. We have a very lively uh, European debate on how we can promote human rights and how we can support human rights defenders and institutions. So we would love, of course, also to hear from both your countries or to have a counterpart in, in, in Switzerland and Italy to uh, debate uh, and, and to promote human rights. So if you can address that wish somewhere in your governments or to your governments, I think that would be also useful. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Ms. Kofler, also for this practical offer. Uh, I think Krista Oynonen is uh, p uh, writing in the chat that uh, genuine intergovernmental dialogue is important with sharing experiences. Yeah, that's what you have already pinpointed to Ms. Kofler. And that this recommendation is maybe a good entry point. Yeah. So now we come uh, to an end of the first panel. Thanks, uh, uh, Lord Balf. Thanks, uh, Christoph Borels. Uh, thanks, Antoine Bause. And thanks, uh, Bärbel Kofler. For this very interesting debate, I think it has shown that uh, uh, in this main institution for the rule of law, <laughs> which we have in Europe, it's a very good that we have now a third recommendation uh, among those for ombudsperson and for civil society, how the relationship can be improved and how the Council of Europe can strengthen these institutions. We have learned about how, uh, how close these institutions are, civil society, ombuds institutions, national human rights institutions, they all have their role to play in this main institution for the rule of law, but there can be really a fruitful exchange between the institutions of the Council of Europe and the national human rights institutions and these other institutions. There are a lot of opportunities which we have seen, but there's also a need for support for these institutions when they come under threat. I think that is what we can take with us. Thanks for all this rich exchange which we had. And um, now we are coming to an end of the first panel and we have something like five minutes of a break uh, before I hand over uh, to my colleague, <laughs> Enrida, for uh, uh, moderating the second panel. Yeah? So a five minutes break, which allows you to pick up a glass of water or a new cup of coffee. And then we continue with the second panel. Thanks a lot for listening and thanks for this rich exchange. Distinguished panelists and participants. In fact, for reasons behind of our control, our Nino can participate today and I fulfilling the role of the moderator. I am Erinda Balanza, the Ombudsperson of Albania. I'm delighted to see, although only virtually, such a qualitative group of participants with us today. This panel will focus on independent oversight mechanisms of the Council of Europe and how cooperation with and support from, for NHRIs can be further strengthen in follow-up of the Council of Ministers recommendation on national human rights institutions. And that, uh, after the keynote speech of, uh, of President Spano, I think that he delivered some very important messages, but in my view, the most important one is that the effective implementation of the convention needs the hard work and meaningful cooperation of many actors, including domestic government, parliaments, courts, national human rights institutions, and the oversight bodies of Council of Europe. We have the pleasure, in fact, of welcoming Judge Jude Tajulia Motok from Romania this morning, who will be participating to our panel discussion and further develop some key messages delivered by the president of the court in his video message. Indeed, our second panel this morning will allow to further develop on the topic of cooperation and support of the Council of Europe for national human rights institutions from the point of view of Council of Europe independent oversight bodies. 
also other than the Court of European, the, the European Court of Human Rights. It is my pleasure to welcome the following high-level speakers. Ms. Dunja Mijatovic, Commissioner for Human Rights of the Council of Europe. Ms. Karin Lukas, President of the European Committee of Social Rights. Ms. Veronika Bilkova, Member of the Bureau of Venice Commission. As reflected in the practice of my own office, cooperation between NHRIs and Council of Europe independent oversight bodies is of crucial importance to further the enjoyment of human rights, democracy and rule of law domestically. About one year ago, the whole world was faced with the emergency situation derived as a consequences of COVID-19 pandemic. Our ability to understand the extent of such emergency and how it impacted our role as NHRIs and our rights as citizens was a huge challenge too. For my institution, the statements issued by Commissioner Mijatovic and the Committee of Social and Economic Rights, the Guide on Interpretation of Article 15 of the Convention by European Court of Human Rights and compilation of the Venice Commission's on State of Emergency Powers, other than source book on human rights have been of paramount importance in providing us support for our domestic statements and interventions. Further, several bodies adopted their, uh, their work of, uh, and they uh, really um, adopted new innovative working procedures in attempting to remain effective mechanism for the promotion of human rights. In the name of our institutions, I would like to thank you all in playing such a role and not only in issuing recommendations and statements, but as well uh, by leading by example, in particular with respect to alternative working procedures. The adoption of the Council of Ministers recommendation of national human rights institution provides an additional opportunity to develop and strengthen the ongoing cooperation. In this respect, allow me to address the first question to Ms. Mijatovic. Dear Commissioner, the Council of Ministers recommendation recognizes the well-established cooperation between you and your office and national human rights institutions or ENRI. What is, according to you, the added value for working with NHRIs? Based on your experience, how can effective cooperation between the Council of Europe and national human rights institutions or ENRI can be further developed. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, let me just. Oh, okay. Can you hear me? Good. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Erinda. I would just like to uh, greet you all. Uh, thank you for the invitation. I would like to greet my fellow panelists. Uh, I'm really glad to be able to join you today uh, in this very important uh, discussion. When it comes to cooperation with the um, um, NHRIs, I think uh, it is uh, clear and known to all of you that you are essential partners uh, in my human rights uh, uh, dialogue uh, when uh, I work with the Council of Europe member states. Uh, you are my natural partners, I can say. Uh, a very good uh, cooperation between uh, my office and national human rights uh, institutions is not only a good practice. Uh, it is especially uh, foreseen in my mandate as commissioner that I work uh, with the national human rights institutions. Um, this cooperation, uh, I would say, takes many forms. Um, I meet uh, with the representatives of uh, national human rights uh, institutions during my country visits and uh, in Strasbourg when this is possible, of course, this last year was extremely challenging, but we found our ways uh, uh, in staying in touch, in having discussions, uh, and also being able to have a very rapid response when uh, it was needed. I participated in the events, meetings organized by um, different institutions individu individually, but also uh, through uh, their networks, uh, and uh, this is also something that is of great importance. Um, my office has also regularly uh, organized uh, events uh, to share information, to share strategies uh, with national institutions. And these exchanges can, in a way, reinforce uh, our common uh, efforts to achieve real impact in defending human rights, which nowadays is extremely uh, challenging. I would also just add that the added value of this uh, good cooperation between international and regional organizations 
and independent um, national human rights institutions cannot uh, be overstated. For example, um, I always welcome their insight about national uh, human rights developments, which is extremely important. Um, it is also of great help uh, that they send information and draw my attention to such developments. So these, these, um, uh, you know, this established uh, trust, I would call it, uh, and cooperation also uh, brings uh, more resolutions in certain issues of great importance or even says mutual importance uh, when defending uh, um, human rights. Uh, so the expertise, their expertise about the national context uh, is an asset that I can rely on when, for example, formulating well-targeted recommendations um, to the authorities, it would be impossible uh, to do my work uh, without this uh, kind of cooperation. And I also count on uh, national uh, institutions uh, to help me work better uh, understood nationally uh, and to help, you know, press, uh, to help press for the implementation of my recommendations, which is a huge challenge uh, in all of our Council of Europe member states. Sometimes, you know, the states are very willing to agree with the recommendations, but then when it comes to the implementation, um, you know how difficult it is. So um, I noticed also that the new committee uh, of ministers' recommendation uh, invites our member states to consider ways to strengthen the part participation of national human rights institutions and their uh, network in the activities of the Council of Europe, which I think is a very important step uh, in the right uh, direction. It is good that it's recognized on such a high level. And there is no doubt uh, for me that this would be a win-win uh, initiative for both uh, our organizations and national human rights uh, institutions. And I would welcome further step in this uh, direction. Actually, um, it was very well explained, um, the, the answer to the question, it was very much detailed and actually it showed how important is this relationship that has been noted in the Council of Ministers recommendation. But let me turn to the, to the other oversight institution, the European Court of Human Rights that has played a tremendous role in the past years, interpreting and contextualizing the provisions of the European Convention of Human Rights, all citizens of the Area Council of Europe. In this respect, I would like to ask Judge Maltak, building on the video message of President Spano, what do you believe is the key added value of national human rights institutions for the work of the European Court of Human Rights, thereby implementation of the European Convention of Human Rights? How do you believe can this role be further strengthened and supported? If you can, I am. Um, you sorry, can. Me, you have to. You have you to unmute. unmute yourself. Can you unmute yourself, please? Yeah. Thank, thank you. you thank much, you very much. Thank you very much, Jorinda. I am very pleased to be here at this uh, very important meeting with uh, the National Human Rights Institution and my my distinguished uh, uh, panelists. The uh, the Commissioner on Human Rights, the representative of the uh, Venice Commission, an old friend of mine, Veronica Brinkova, and uh, uh, Karen Lucas for the um, Social Rights uh, Committee, and uh, yourself. So following what, uh, what our President Robert Spano had said, I think you know that the success of the convention system and of the work, work uh, is incomplete if the convention is not uh, reaching the domestic level and if we don't have a culture of human rights at the level of, uh, of the countries uh, that are member of the Council of Europe and not, not only because the, con the European Human Rights Convention is wider in their also impact that uh, only the state of the Council of Europe. Uh, 
So I think that uh, the, um, the added value of uh, the national and human rights institution derives from the official role that uh, they are giving and the advice they are giving to the state authorities, the national authorities on the matter of the implementation of the convention and also of the court judgment with engaging with uh, civil society and rights holders. So the very well known expression bridges builders is more appropriate to define this role, the, the role of national human rights institution and their difficult task in fostering on awareness at the national level of the method uh, to implement the convention and the court uh, judgment. In particular, when it comes to the work of the court, the national human rights institution, they carry specific weight because the, they provide the court with various perspectives. I think the most one of the most important perspective they they provide the court is uh, the, is regarding the human rights situation in the concerned state, providing information on the national level and the practice of the specific subject. For instance, in the case of Massen versus the Netherlands, where the Netherlands Human Rights Institute presented an overview of the domestic rule on pretrial detention or and of the domestic jurisprudence in this matter, that had revealed the tendency of the court to give few reasons for their decision and standard phrasing with little reference on the circumstances of the individual cases. The, uh, this, uh, this overview had a very important uh, role in, uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in this uh, case, Marshall versus Netherlands and the decision of, of the court. Another example is Khan versus France, where the National Advisory Commission on Human Rights provided the court with data and statistics on the ground regarding the situation of unaccompanied foreign minors in France. Uh, moreover, we have other, other very, very important case for the court where the freedom of speech was at stance. It is Rustavi II Broadcasting Company versus Georgia, where again, we have the National Institution of Georgia given us elements regarding the freedom of speech in, uh, in Georgia. So we see uh, several cases, uh, the last one being Big Brother uh, versus UK, where we have national institutions that provide us either with uh, information regarding the human rights situation or the specific institutional uh, situation on the, on the ground, or the legal basis sometimes, or practice of in, uh, in this, uh, this area. We see a, a variety of information that they can give to us a third party um, intervention. And this played a very important role for us in solving this, uh, these cases, as I said. Another important part for the court, and uh, President Robert Spano just said also, it's regarding the, the question of the implementation and execution of, uh, of the judgment. The national uh, human rights institutions are in touch with, um, uh, the, with the, the registry of the court in regarding the execution of, uh, of the judgment. And uh, we have also provided a guide for national human rights institution, uh, it will be useful for them, we thought, to know when, because this is the main question, to know when they intervene, in which case they intervene, at which point they intervene. So this is the reason we have provided with uh, this uh, guide. So we see a variety of examples where we uh, have this uh, uh, this intervention of the of the national human rights institution there is very useful for the uh, court. Thank you very much, Erinda. Uh, thank you very much, Judge Matok. Actually, in particular, by emphasizing the fact that we, as national human rights institutions, have to be a bridge or or have to review, in particular, uh, the implementation phase of the decisions, and that there we can play a real uh, role in uh, defending the rights of our people better by implementing the, the human rights uh, decision of the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, at this point, I would like to turn the focus of the panel to the role of European Committee of Social Rights. As previously mentioned here with us today is Ms. Karin Lucas, president of such committee. The same question goes for her. What are the most important ways in which national human rights institutions or ENRI can cooperate and support with the work with the social uh, 
with European Social Committee. How can, on the other hand, the committee support the strong role and meaningful participation of national human rights institution in its work and in protection of social rights in Europe more broadly? Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, fellow colleagues, it is a pleasure to speak to you as a representative of the European Committee of Social Rights and to discuss this highly relevant topic during such a formidable event. I've really enjoyed the presentations uh, and, and discussions so far. The European Committee of Social Rights is the monitoring body of the European Social Charter, which guarantees fundamental social and economic rights from the right to work to the right to housing. Its monitoring goes through two avenues, the state reporting procedure and the collective complaints procedure. Now, in my view, national human rights institutions have become vital partners for our work in both the reporting uh, procedure and the collective complaints procedure within the European Social Charter. NHRIs can be bridge builders between governments and civil society and know extremely well the situation on the ground. Therefore, they provide data and evidence, which helps us, the committee, to assess possible violations of the Charter. According to Article 1 of the additional protocol providing for a system of collective complaints, which has been accepted by now 16 member states of the Council of Europe uh, last month, it was Spain who uh, accepted, only certain specific organizations, namely employers' organizations, trade unions, and European NGOs can lodge such complaints. Nevertheless, NHRIs have a number of possibilities to express their views and concerns in this procedure. First of all, they can engage with the committee during an ongoing complaint brought by others. If you're interested in doing so, you're very welcome to contact the Secretariat of the European Social Charter by mail or by email. Second, the committee may also invite other organizations, institutions or persons such as NHRIs to share their views on the alleged violation. For example, in collective complaint number 114 on the rights of foreign unaccompanied minors, the committee relied very much on the information provided by the Défenseur des droits in France. Furthermore, NHRIs can provide input to the committee under the so-called simplified reporting procedure under which the respective state is also obliged to report uh, follow-up information on measures taken where the committee has found a breach of the charter. Now, this was for the collective complaints procedure. In the framework of the reporting procedure, NHRIs are invited to provide comments regarding the annual reports submitted by states' parties on the accepted provisions. Those comments must be submitted to the Secretariat of the Charter before April 30th. Because of the COVID situation, an exception has been made this year, where the deadline for comments on the national reports relating to the thematic group Health, Social Security and Social Protection was extended to June 30th of this year. And last but not least, NHRIs can also contribute to the reports on unaccepted provisions that states parties to the Charter are obliged to submit every five years. In this way, the Charter offers possibilities for NHRIs in their work to hold the state and state authorities accountable for their social rights obligations. Having said that, the European Committee of Social Rights is very keen on supporting the work of European NHRIs. The Secretariat of the European Social Charter stands ready to guide them through the reporting process and offers help with any arising problems and questions, for example, regarding formats and deadlines. In this regard, work is underway on a guide on how NHRIs and other equality bodies can engage with the committee. The guide is expected to be published this summer and will contain detailed information on the Charter, the collective complaints procedure and a reporting system, as well as information on which and how organizations can participate. participate. Moreover, annual meetings will be organized with NHRIs to discuss the current reporting cycle and explain provisions and questions submitted to state parties. And finally, the committee's comments and findings can strengthen the position of the NHRIs, increase the pressure on governments to introduce reforms and enable stakeholders to hold their states accountable. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this uh, comprehensive explanation of all the possible ways that national human rights institutions can interact with the, with the committee and the way how committee can help actually 
uh, energized in uh, creating uh, a reality that protects more the enjoyment of the social and economic rights, which are very important now uh, in our realities from one side, and on the other side are the ones that are less recognized by our, by, by our constitutions because they enter into, into the area of social objectives more than uh, real rights provided by our constitutions. Uh, so this is absolutely a very, very interesting way of how we can try to make real those social objectives. Uh, another crucial oversight body is the Venice Commission that has played a significant role with its ongoing recommendations for, the, for interpreting the human rights and rule of law standards in concrete cases. Therefore, our interaction with Venice Commission has become more and more significant as our role as national human rights institution has grown constantly in our national realities. However, I would like to ask Ms. Milkova, what are the most important ways in which national human rights institutions or Henry can engage with the Venice Commission? How can this cooperation be further developed according to you? Good afternoon to all of you. I would first like to express my appreciation to Henry and to the German presidency for the organization of such an interesting and timely debate. It is a pleasure for the Venice Commission and it is a pleasure for me personally to join this debate. The Venice Commission, and I recall it is an advisory body specialized in the areas of constitution and international law. So the Venice Commission considers itself a natural partner of national human rights institutions, at least those operating in compliance with the Paris principles. We pursue the same overall goal, that of ensuring respect for human rights, democracy, and the rule of law. To reach this goal, we shall, and we do, work together, providing each other support and assistance. The Venice Commission benefits from such support and assistance by national human rights institutions in several different contexts, out of which I will mention two. First, when drafting its opinions and studies, the Venice Commission welcomes submissions that cast light on the legal developments at the national level. NHRIs are among those who regularly provide such submissions, and this is really appreciated. I wanted to give some concrete examples, but then I realized I would need to quote almost all our opinions. Secondly, National human rights institutions, or at least those of them who have an explicit constitutional basis, may turn to the Venice Commission and may ask it to assess the legal framework under which they operate in a country-specific opinion. And that brings me to the other side of the coin, namely to how the Venice Commission supports and assists national human rights institutions. Again, just two examples. So first, the Venice Commission adopts at the request of national human rights institutions themselves or of other national or international actors, opinions in which it analyzes national legal acts that are applicable to these institutions. Over the 31 years of its existence, the Venice Commission has adopted such opinions with respect to ombudsman or other human rights institutions in some 15 countries, including Armenia, Azerbaijan, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Kosovo, Luxembourg, Malta, Montenegro, Moldova, Northern Macedonia, and Serbia. The most recent in this series is the opinion on the people's advocate of Moldova which was adopted at the request of the People's Advocate this March, that means March 2021. In addition to these country-specific opinions, the Venice Commission has also issued certain general studies, reports, and compilations that contribute to the clarification of legal standards applicable in this area. The most important among these general studies are First, the compilations on ombudsman institutions, 
issued in 2011 that will need some update. And then the well-known Venice principles. That means the principles on the protection and promotion of the Ombudsman institution. These principles adopted in 2019 and subsequently endorsed by the Council of Ministers were already mentioned by the Committee of Ministers, sorry. They're already mentioned in, in the morning panel. So I will just briefly recall that it is a document that contains 25 principles that should guide the organization and the operation of Ombudsman institutions. And while formally limited to Ombudsman institutions, these principles are certainly of high relevance to national human rights institutions more broadly. In fact, they explicitly mention that the mandate of the Ombudsman institution shall cover the protection and promotion of human rights and fundamental freedoms. So sharing of information, requesting and providing a country specific opinion and clarifying legal standards applicable to national human rights institutions. These are just some examples of how the Venice Commission and NHRIs work together and mutually support and assist each other. So the partnership, as we can see, is well in place. It has different forms and it produces concrete and valuable results. And by means of conclusion, I would like to stress that the Venice Commission is really keen on pursuing this partnership and that it is also ready to discuss the ways in which this partnership could be strengthened. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Bilkova. Actually, uh, it is true, we have seen ourselves as National Human Rights Institution, how important the relationship and the continuous collaboration with the Venice Commission has, has helped us with respect to uh, providing standards for national human rights issues and for constitutional issues. Definitely, the Venice principles and Ombudsman institutions are a very important uh, tool that will uh, help and enhance the ombudsman and of course uh, giving them the same uh, positive uh, thing that uh, the other national human rights institutions have the Paris principles in this way Paris principles together with the Venice principle will play better uh, uh, established uh, role or, or let's say as they will work as a source book for all of us and for our uh, uh, parliaments and governments to understand our role. Uh, let me get to the second round of the questions. We are almost on time. Uh, as discussed earlier this morning, the Council of Europe of Ministers' recommendations requires for each Council of Europe member state to have an effective pluralist and independent national human rights institution in place. Commissioner Miatovic, on the basis of your experience and in light of your 2018 human rights comment on NGRIs, what are the most important recommendations elaborated in the adopted text by the Council of Ministers in which state authorities need to implement? Well, I very much hope uh, that our member states, uh, which adopted this, uh, this text on their own initiative, will carefully consider uh, all the recommendations uh, in it as they are all important, I would say, and relevant uh, to strengthen uh, national human rights institutions. That being said, uh, drawing from my experience to date, um, as you um, stressed, um, I would like to mention uh, briefly four recommendations that in my view stand out as particularly uh, important. First, uh, I think it's very important to, to mention that um, I urge Council of Europe member states uh, that still do not have a fully accredited status A, uh, national human rights institutions to urgently establish one uh, and uh, or to seek accreditation. Uh, this seems obvious, uh, but we still have at least six member states with no national human rights uh, institution whatsoever. So uh, I think this is extremely uh, important uh, to, to mention and to really emphasize uh, that this needs to change. 
Uh, second, I think it's absolutely crucial that member states uh, strictly uh, respect the independence of their NHRIs. Um, I'm concerned uh, that there have been an increased uh, number of attacks, but also uh, attempts to undermine the work of NHRIs in Europe in recent years. Here I'm talking based on facts, uh, based on my visits and communication with NHRIs uh, and beyond. Uh, I stand ready uh, whenever it is helpful um, and after prior consultations, of course, with the institution concerned, to raise my voice uh, whenever a national human rights institution comes under attack. This is extremely important for me and this is something um, that is unacceptable and this is what I communicate also to member states uh, when I find about uh, uh, cases and situations uh, like this and there are been se several recent examples where I had to raise my voice or to engage in order to emphasize that this is uh, unacceptable behavior. Uh, third, um, I think it was important to mention that member states should also ensure that their national human rights institutions have uh, sufficient resources uh, to carry their mandate uh, effectively. This is very important to uh, all of you working uh, for national human rights structures. I know uh, that this is uh, already an issue in some states, uh, but I mostly want to take this uh, opportunity to urge our member states to preserve the resources uh, of their national institutions, even if we are to face a very uh, difficult economic period uh, after the pandemic. Uh, I think in this period now, but particularly in this recovery time that we all hope will start um, rather sooner than later, we will need national human rights uh, um, institutions in order to move uh, forward uh, effectively. And finally, I think it's uh, absolutely essential uh, for national institutions to have access to policy makers, to be consulted uh, in a timely manner um, and for their recommendations to be given serious considerations and to be, of course, implemented. Otherwise, they, their work uh, is in vain. Uh, and what I really do not like to see that their work, uh, their efforts, their recommendations in Unfortunately, uh, too many uh, Council of Europe member states is neglected, put under the carpet and uh, not really considered seriously. Uh, we need to change this. Thank you very much. Actually, four very important messages that, that you gave or, or these four, four cases are, are definitely uh, crucial to our work. And I can attest this personally that all of them are important and remain important even when you are uh, a status national human rights institution. And the fact that we have continuous accreditation process and, and reviews, it's very important for us to keep in mind that we need to continue to fulfill all those criteria. This is for our institutions or from the part of our institutions, but how do you uh, think, or let me ask again, how do you see that uh, the Committee of Ministers will follow the implementation of the recommendations in the next five years. Do you think that there will be a particular way how they can make our uh, governments uh, uh, accountable to address these issues on due time? Well, I, I think it's important to, to, to say that um, um, you know, that the recommendations foresees uh, a review of the implementation in five years. Um, and uh, this is important and in a way it should be a, a strong signal uh, to our member states um, that they should not rest um, their laurels or to put away the recommendations in a drawer, uh, even if they already have a national um, human rights uh, institutions. Um, my message uh, today, uh, but also for, for later, is that there is always a potential to, to improve. Um, in my view, each member state should examine uh, the recommendations and identify which points seem particularly relevant for their national uh, context. Uh, and this should be done in close uh, consultations 
with the national uh, human rights institutions themselves. Um, of course, uh, but also other stakeholders as well, uh, such as civil society and other national human rights structures. Um, recommendations also made by uh, international bodies such as UN, uh, Gandhi Accreditation Committee or ECRI uh, or my office can also be uh, very useful. Uh, this could result in sort of a roadmap uh, of measures uh, which the state can take uh, to strengthen their national institutions uh, in the next five years. So a yearly progress discussion in Parliament, for example, could also be envisaged uh, to keep this process uh, going. And I also want um, to speak uh, about what I can do as Council of Europe Commissioner for, for Human Rights to promote the, the implementation of uh, the recommendation. As uh, mentioned earlier, my mandate includes also cooperating uh, and at the same time uh, facilitating work of national human rights structures. Uh, in this context, I regularly examine the challenges, uh, challenges faced by the national institutions in the context of country visits that I already mentioned. And to name a couple of examples, I did so in the reports that followed um, my visits to Estonia and uh, Bulgaria. Uh, having the Committee of Ministers' recommendations in a way gives me a new point uh, of reference, um, a list of uh, standards uh, agreed uh, to specifically um, by our member states of the Council of Europe. And I think, it, you know, what I will try to do as much as I can uh, is to examine the impl implementation uh, and to refer to it in the future. Uh, of course, this is not going to solve uh, the problems overnight, but at least we have something uh, to use in addition to all other tools that we have at our expo uh, disposal in order to uh, really make sure uh, that there is a uh, I would say, a uh, significant uh, change in a positive direction when it comes Thank to you. the work of NHRIs. Thank you very much, Ms. Miatovic. Actually, uh, I was thinking on the same way while you were uh, making this presentation that probably we can discuss tomorrow in our panel with heads of institutions that a good way may be that in our annual reports, we present a small uh, part or some paragraph stating or, or trying to assess whether our uh, governments have implemented this, uh, this recommendation and how the implementation is going. This can be something that will uh, bring into their uh, attention uh, every year how important this recommendation uh, has been for us. So thank you very much and I will discuss this tomorrow with our uh, heads of institution in our, in our meeting. Uh, going on to the, the question with respect to the European Court of Human Rights. I'd like to ask Judge Motok again. In line with your experience as judge of the European Court of Human Rights, why is it so important to ensure NGRIs have the characteristics of being independent, pluralist, and effective as required by the Council of Ministers recommendation in order for them to provide good contributions to the work of the court? Can you unmute? Yeah. Thank you very much for your uh, work question. Um, as I said before, uh, for us, the third party intervention of national human rights institutions are uh, very important. They have to provide the court with uh, objective reports regarding if it's a presentation of the national legislation or practice or analysis of the court case law or the international jurisprudence and in particular when it comes to presenting factual information from the ground. So in order for national human rights institution to accomplish this task independency primary, only an independent national institution can provide an objective perspective from the ground. So for independence is essential not only for the intervention before the court, but for the entire process of the human rights monitoring in the member states where uh, national human rights institutions play a key role. Uh, 
So what is important uh, for uh, for us as a court is to is the fact that we are playing a role not in a vacuum. We say we are not playing a role in a vacuum regarding the fact that we are playing a role together with other uh, with other treaty bodies at the level of the uh, of the Council of Europe, the, the Commissioner of Human Rights, the the Venice Commission, also, but also. It, with the international treaty is international treaty bodies that uh, commissioner just uh, just mentioned but for us it's also the vacuum is not only international as we said in our case law but also that we are not to playing in a vacuum regarding the national institutions we have to we have to work with together with them in order to implement the human rights at the national level this is the most important task of the court and this is the reason why the independence of uh, of the national human rights institution is essential for the court because we are aware that to once we have uh, a human rights situation at the ground that we don't have any violations of human rights our task is finally uh, fulfilled so we need uh, we need their help on the on the ground. So only if we have an independent institution that can provide this uh, uh, this um, um, advice, that they can they can have this responsibility that was set up in the Paris uh, principle that are mentioned several times in this uh, in this discussion today. So uh, from a judge point of view, independent is not a privilege but an obligation of the concern, an obligation incumbent to national human rights institution in order to achieve a mandatory credibility and effectiveness as human rights as human rights institution it is the reason why paris principle established the necessary guarantees of the independence that must be provided to national human rights institutions and why the committee of ministers set out the recommendation that are the main subject of this uh, this Thank meeting you. So I would also like to brief mention the, the, about the constant of the national human rights independence that are foreseen in the Paris uh, uh, principle and reiterated in the committee recommendation and recall the pluralism and the secure, security of uh, the uh, detainer. So it's essential that national human rights institutions are are pluralist, but also they need to be uh, stable. And uh, indeed, uh, we I cannot talk about this, but as far as we see uh, in Europe today, uh, I cannot talk extensively about this. But as far as we see in Europe today, some attacks to to the uh, to the rule of law institution, we see also unfortunately some attacks to the uh, national institution in order to undermine their uh, pluralism and their uh, security of the tainer, which is uh, really an essential, uh, played an essential uh, role in, uh, in uh, designing independent uh, national uh, uh, institutions. So I think you know, these elements also are fundamental for uh, a breed builder, as I said before, that should have also the characteristic the characteristic that are close, of course, they are not courts, but the characteristic that are close to uh, to uh, our uh, court and fulfilling our very productive uh, dialogue. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Judge Mata, for the for the great uh, messages that you actually gave, and they are very welcomed from national human rights institutions. And we do understand that it is a responsibility for us to be independent and to show that we are independent in order to have the continuous um, support of the people and the trust of the people. And we are here to ask all the other governmental bodies and the state authorities to build on the trust of the people and to work always or to base their work on the trust of the people. So, of course, we show the example on that respect that the trust of the people is very important for us. Uh, changing uh, the the um, panelist, I would like to ask the president, the Ms. Karim Dukas, the the president of the Committee on Social Rights. On the basis of your experience, what are the most important recommendations from the Council of Ministers text, which state authorities need to follow up? 
I think strong, independent and engaged national women's institutions are essential for well-functioning and democratic societies. They're also key players in the struggle for economic and social rights in Europe. Due to the fact that human rights monitoring and reporting are core elements of their mandate, as well as their unique standing deriving from their central position between civil society and the state, but also I think regional and international levels, they have an excellent understanding of the human rights situation in their countries. So among many other activities that advise governments on the possible impact of policies on vulnerable groups, this is very important for us uh, and report to parliaments, cooperate with media and raise awareness of economic and social rights and promote the culture of rights and equality in the public. Besides the introduction of the Paris Principles, the establishment of the European Network of National Human Rights Institutions in 2013 has proven to be a major milestone for the development of strong and effective European NHRIs. Nevertheless, this potential has not yet fully been exploited, as my previous speakers, the previous speakers as have already said, uh, by regional actors, and there are some remaining concerns. Firstly, there are shortcomings in terms of transparency or participation when it comes to the decision-making body selection and appointment procedures. Also, institutions often lack inappropriate funding or struggle with the limited scope of their mandate. For this reason, I think the recommendation of the Committee of Ministers to strengthen NHRIs is of, is of particular importance. This means that the Council of Europe states should guarantee the broadest possible mandate a competence-based, transparent, and participatory process of selection and appointment, as well as adequate funding. And although we can nowadays find NHRIs in the majority of European countries that fully comply with the Paris Principles, several countries, as already been said, still lack an accredited institution. The economic crisis of 2008 has highlighted the importance of realizing economic and social rights in order to shield European citizens from poverty and, ex and social exclusion a need that is underlined even more by the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. NHRIs play a key role in giving insight on the COVID-19 situation in their respective countries. We have seen that the failure to deliver on the right to health has detrimental effects on other rights. It increases poverty for children and unemployment, for example. Although we cannot assess the extent, exact extent of the crisis yet, it is very clear that a major effort will be needed to recover from it. We will face austerity measures and tough decisions on how available resources will be spent. To ensure that social rights are adequately protected throughout this period of economic recovery, we need, we very much need, strong cooperation between the Council of Europe and European countries on the one hand, and effective pluralist and independent NHRIs on the other. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Lucas, for this de detailed and yet to the point um, uh, presentation. And I uh, definitely think that we need to do more with that respect in order to uh, address all the issues, the social and economic rights within our uh, countries. Uh, last but not least, I'd like to ask Mrs. Vilkova from Venice Commission. On the basis of your experience as a member of the Bureau of the Venice Commission, but also following closely developed in the Czech Republic, uh, and as, as actually one of the people that have produced uh, those very good uh, uh, advisory notes that I have explained earlier in my initially for the COVID-19 and for the emergency powers, because you were one of the authors of those advisory. Uh, what are the most important recommendations from the Council of Ministers text uh, to the state authorities that need to be followed up? I must admit, I find this question very difficult to answer. If we construe a house, is it more important to have the walls, the roofs, the door? I would say that we need all of those because if anything of them is missing, then the house will either collapse or it will not serve its, its purpose. And I would say that the same applies to national human rights institutions. So these institutions can only fulfill their mandate if all the recommendations provided by the committee of ministers are actively pursued and ideally met. 
Yet, if, uh, if you insist and if you want me to try to identify the core recommendations, then I would largely echo what has already been said by the previous speakers. So I would identify six of these, maybe not recommendations, maybe broad principles, because that goes back largely both to the Paris principles and to the, to the Venice, Venice uh, principles. So these six recommendations would be the following. First, the need for a strong mandate in all areas of human rights and encompassing the capacity to engage in many different types of activities. Secondly, independence. The importance of this element, of this principle has already been mentioned several times and I just need to EQ what has been said. Thirdly, pluralistic composition. That's, that's also something that, that is very important and that is crucial for national human rights institutions to be able to serve as this famous bridge between national authorities and civil society. Fourth, adequate resources, both in terms of funding and in terms of staffing. We can achieve a lot out of enthusiasm but uh, we, need, uh, we need material resources to be able uh, to, uh, to achieve what we are supposed to achieve. Fifth, friendly environment or what is labeled in the recommendations as securing, as a safe and enabling environment. That's it, that is another element which is very important for national human rights institutions to be really able to fulfill their mission. And finally, one element which gets often missing from, uh, from the recommendations or from the, from the set of principles, but which has been stressed by the Venice Commission in its Venice principles, that is the firm legal and ideally constitutional basis for the operation of national human rights institutions. Without a strong legal or constitutional ideally basis, these institutions might face practical difficulties both at the national level and at the international level. I already mentioned that, for instance, uh, the firm constitutional basis enables these institutions to request an opinion of the Venice Commission. Thank you very much, actually, Ms. Vilkova, because uh, it is very true what you said, that um, although we want to have, uh, let's say, which are the most important recommendations, it is true, all of them are important and all of them are relevant and they can continue, they remain to be relevant, as I explained to you, even for uh, a principal uh, status uh, institution. So it's we have to have those powers and those characteristics and we have to maintain those powers and those characteristics. So after this uh, very detailed and very professional and um, let me say from, from my point, inspirational presentation of all uh, our distinguished panelists, I would like to know a little bit now the position of some managerized, our position, how we see the same uh, issue that was uh, put into question into this, in this panel. So I would uh, first like to ask uh, or to give the floor to Mr. Miroslav Urablevsky from the Polish NGRI and member of Henry board to uh, address uh, this panel from his perspective with respect to his position. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for, for uh, uh, this uh, short sort of time. Uh, to say uh, very briefly uh, that uh, mm, those uh, 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 history of the uh, independent uh, institutions uh, uh, in Central Europe uh, is uh, somehow changing. Uh, for many years, uh, Polish institutions served, and I, I do believe it will be serving as a, uh, a good example of fully independent uh, institution with a status. Uh, the, some 15 years ago, the uh, Polish Ombudsman uh, uh, presented the Charter of uh, Effective uh, Ombudsman, and it was used by uh, international organizations. 
Uh, however, uh, we uh, in this panel and other the first panel, it was already mentioned that there might be some uh, developments, uh, uh, like political developments, which uh, make uh, those institutions. Uh, 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 and the, they put them in a diff, much more difficult position. Uh, currently in Poland, we have a kind of a stalemate uh, stay in the parliament. Uh, the term of the former ombudsman, Mr. Bodnar, elapsed in September. And for uh, three times, the parliament was not able to uh, nominate a new uh, commissioner for human rights. Uh, however, uh, because of the stalemate, uh, uh, the, uh, the group of deputies uh, uh, sent a motion to the Constitutional Tribunal, uh, who declared uh, just uh, 11 days ago uh, that the provision uh, that the former ombudsman uh, executes his mandate uh, after his term uh, elapsed is unconstitutional. And uh, the uh, uh, this provision will lose its uh, legal force in three months in July. And of course, what comes next? This is a very important question because uh, 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 the constitution provides that people have the right to ask the independent institution, the commissioner for his legal aid. Uh, so the, the, the best way, of course, uh, is the nomination, which will respect the constitution. Uh, however, uh, unconstitutional uh, makeshift and political nominee without a constitutional mandate is also uh, unfortunately possible uh, uh, if the uh, parliamentary uh, same made will uh, remain. Uh, the Constitutional Court, unfortunately, asked the Parliament uh, uh, to pass a law uh, providing for a temporary uh, uh, solution. However, in uh, opinion of nearly all uh, constitutional experts, it is not possible with, uh, without a violation of the Constitution. So the uh, a nomination of the next commissioner fully compatibly with uh, uh, the uh, uh, procedure described in the law. This is the nomination by the lower chamber of the parliament and consent of the Senate, the higher chamber is, is necessary. Of course, uh, we, we ask ourselves and uh, uh, it has to be discussed what, ca what can be done. We can wrap it uh, up. Yeah. Uh, just last last question, of course, uh, that helpless inertia is, is frustrating. So I think uh, all your advice uh, uh, and what has already uh, been said uh, is to be taken into account. However, I do think that uh, uh, we all have to think about uh, uh, national institutions and uh, citizens who actually are benefiting from their existence. That's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are taking two more reactions from two other NGRIs, and then we will give the possibility to the panel to react uh, on, uh, on all the, the interventions. The second one, uh, I am inviting our, the representative of the Slovenian NGRI, Simona Drenik Babdek, uh, to present her view uh, to the panel and to this, uh, to this meeting. Thank you very much. Um, well, I was carefully listening to this interesting and inspiring discussion. Um, and as a former member of the CDDH drafting group on civil society and national human rights institutions until the beginning of 2020, when I had the privilege to become part of NHRI community, I could say that it was of great benefit for the Council of Europe that ENRI uh, cooperates uh, with the bodies of the or relevant groups, working groups of the Council of Europe. I would like to express uh, my gratitude also uh, to this event 
also on behalf of Mr. Peter Setino, Slovenian Ombudsman, uh, to the German presidency and to Henry. This is really a forward-looking event, not only for NHRIs, but for the European society uh, or uh, as such. Maybe I could share that it was not a coincidence in Slovenia uh, that a political decision to strengthen a mandate of the ombudsperson institution to comply with the Paris principle actually coincided with the political decision to uh, make a holistic approach to the implementation of the judgments of the European Court of Human Rights. It was in fact a parallel process for which uh, ombuds institution was pleading uh, both for both uh, processes for years. So while we went to a five-year journey of efforts to meet international standards, uh, to comply with uh, Paris principles and to be accredited as A status um, in January this year. During the same period, uh, we also uh, cooperated closely with governmental structures to uh, lower down the number of um, unimplemented judgments of the European Court of Human Rights. So uh, this is how to implement international human rights standards into the national context. These are two aspects, both are important. So, for example, from 309 of unimplemented judgments in 2000, at the end of 2015, uh, which was approximately more than 95% of all judgments against Slovenia, we lowered down that number uh, to eight unimplemented judgments at present. So I think this is a political will, uh, which is important uh, for each member states but also um, the capacity of the NHRIs uh, and uh, to help proper resources uh, to promote international or regional human rights at the national level. I would not mention, but I very much support the uh, engagement of ENRI uh, on the um, promotion of the implementation of the European Convention on Human Rights, either through uh, either through webinars which were organized last year or through a guide for NHRIs on third party interventions, which was already mentioned. And uh, of course, the rule nine submissions, uh, which are also of great importance. And I can maybe just mention that for us, uh, over that process, we also so developed the cooperation with the civil society on that issues. I would just mention our good cooperation with European Implementation Network, which is a European NGO, uh, which, from which we really benefit uh, information and expertise, given the fact that uh, usually in some states, uh, NHRIs do not have a very uh, broad capacity and that our institution is also an ombuds institution. So it means dealing with a huge number of individual complaints. Maybe uh, to mention also, um, that it is uh, a privilege also uh, for the ENRI and NHRIs to cooperate uh, with the uh, CDDH implementation uh, uh, drafting group on the implementation of the European Convention of Human Rights. Uh, this is a great privilege, but also I think the, the, a great uh, uh, responsibility for NHRIs to contribute to the effective implementation of human rights. Uh, maybe one last thing is that um, the NHRIs um, are willing uh, to contribute to the national, in, uh, to the oversight mechanisms, and that we uh, are willing to be, for example, included through national uh, visits of these institutions and on written and other reportings. And while we have some good practice examples, I could also say that some institutions still do not recognize uh, NHRIs as uh, the relevant domestic uh, uh, stakeholders or uh, the institutions they would uh, cooperate with. So I would like to encourage all the institutions to take note of this expertise and or um, independent source of information uh, they could have from the NHRIs. Uh, I would stop on that. Yeah. Thank you once more and I hope uh, this is just a starting point of uh, future, uh, even uh, more uh, fruitful and strengthened cooperation.
Thank you, Simona. Sorry, I do not want to be rude, but we had a, a certain time limit and I would like to give the floor to the panelists for, for them to, to react, that's why. Uh, finally, the last uh, NHRI that will present the point of view is the Scottish NHRI, and I'm inviting is Judith Robertson uh, to express her views. And after that, uh, the panelists will have two minutes each to, to react. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Arinda, and thank you very much to Henry for inviting me to participate and really welcome that. I want to say, first of all, from a perspective in Scotland, we really welcome this uh, uh, um, a set of recommendations around, around NHRIs and the importance of NHRIs. While we are an A-status institution, we, have, we are deemed to be independent. Uh, many of the issues that are being highlighted, I wouldn't say we are subject of attacks or interference. That doesn't happen in Scotland. But the resource question and the mandate question, um, uh, while we're, you know, we're, we're very much, um, we have the, 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 the space to operate um, uh, and, and the freedom to do so and the support to do so, in fact, both from Parliament, government and civil society, uh, which is, I, I understand, across Europe, quite a privileged position. Um, we are also in that state of looking to strengthen our mandate and also increase the resource base to the organisation. So the recommendations as they are made and the, and the, the entirety of those recommendations enable us to identify um, where, where we, can, we also can be further strengthened and supported um, domestically to, increase, to, to support the mandate of the, of the institution. And, and the, 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 the set of recommendations that have been made by the Council of Europe and by the ministers will really help us reinforce that in Scotland. So enable us to, to uh, make, make presentations to the parliament and to government uh, so that we're setting that within a wider context of just a, a, a domestic institutional context, but actually this is a European um, dynamic and something that as a, as a, uh, within Scotland particularly, um, uh, a, a governmental sort of process and dynamic which looks to the international groupings, international bodies for, for leadership and support, I think is to be really welcomed. So that's my sort of first comment. My second comment is in relation to the general support we've had from the um, Office of the Commissioner for Human Rights in the past, um, and that's been really welcomed and also very significant. Um, some years ago, if people will remember, if they've been engaged, that we that we um, launched and developed Scotland's National Action Plan for Human Rights, and Niels Musnick, the previous Commissioner, was, was very um, supportive of that process, vocal in his support of that process, and, uh, and that ongoing engagement engagement um, of both him and the Commissioner in, in the developments in Scotland has been really welcomed and also really, um, again, provided that international, European and international context for the progressive developments that are being made and, and, and set it in that international and European uh, uh, sort of setting, which has, again, been really important in the Scottish context, because while at one level, uh, we might be deemed, you know, making lots of progressive movements. And um, we also need to ensure that those progressive movements are shored up, are consolidated, are resourced and deliver meaningfully for people on the ground in relation to actually accessing their human rights. We have huge gaps between both the rhetoric and the reality, um, as would be evidenced across many European countries, I am sure. And so, so that ongoing engagement and sense of both support and uh, maybe slightly softer, but still their scrutiny, um, I think, is really important in, in enabling us within that context, not just to be that sort of lone, not, we're not a lone voice for human rights in Scotland at all, but to be that sort of um, UN representative body saying you, you, we need to make progress here, I think has been really important. And uh, we welcome that ongoing relationship um, for those of you who have tried to set up a national action plan for human rights, which delivers um, and is resourced. You will know the ongoing challenges that that presents, uh, both delivering it and reporting on it, monitoring it, reporting on it and ensuring that there's adequate um, compliance around that. So we've really welcomed the support um, um, of the Council of Europe and the Commissioner's Office in that regard, and I'm sure we'll no doubt do so again. Um, the final piece I want to talk about is in relation to the, 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 the social charter, uh, the European social charter and reporting on, on that process. Um, we haven't, hadn't previously done that and have decided this year we are going to submit a, a, a response 
uh, to the uh, um, committee's report on the UK. Uh, the much devolved competence in Scotland is much of the um, social rights at stake are devolved to the Scottish Government and Parliament and therefore we do see there is a role and it's a really important again locating it within these European institutions I think is very important it, it contributes to our, um, our broader mandate in relation to the UN um, but it also allows us to have another platform where we can make presentations um, on, on, um, on economic and social rights particularly now in a context where Scotland is looking to make progress in terms of the incorporation of economic social rights um, and to incorporate a range of treaties um, much more proactively than has been done in the past. And so our engagement in the European processes and the Council of Europe, Europe processes in relation to economic and social rights, we think is, is really important. And we're really, we've not done that before. We're really interested to do it and to see how that pans out and, and what difference that makes domestically to, again, again provide that that uh, european and and setting for accountability i mean from our perspective this is an accountability mechanism it's a further platform it's a way of providing comparative examples internationally and um, we do this in relation to the cpt um uh, on on you know the the, the the issues in relation to detention um and and now um, we're, we're really pleased to say we are making progress and very glad <laughs> that we've been given an extension in the context of COVID to the end of June, but also that COVID context is also uh, another driver in, do, in, in make, taking this step because we think that, that, that accountability mechanism in Europe provides additional weight and emphasis, in which, which I think we need. Um, so I will finish there. Thank you. Thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you. To, so that's, yeah. Thank you. Sorry for, for trying to, um, to be a little bit time sensitive. But um, there are, uh, I see that in the chat box, there are even two questions, one from, uh, from the Finnish NGRI and one from the Greek NGRI that I would uh, suggest to the panelists to have a look and, and probably uh, answer to those. There is one directly to the Venice Commission and one with respect, to, I believe, to, no, the other one is, is, is general, the one, the one from, from Greece. Uh, starting in the normal uh, way, how uh, your presentations uh, were, so starting from Ms. Miatovic, then to Judge Motok, to Ms. Lucas, and then to Mrs. Uh, Bilkova, I would like your reactions uh, to these uh, uh, questions that came from the energy rise. Thank you. Two minutes. Thank you. Uh, it would be very difficult to, to reply uh, to all the issues raised, uh, and I know that our time is limited. Uh, nevertheless, I'll try to tackle a few uh, issues that were raised in relation to Poland. Um, and what uh, Mr. Wroblewski was uh, um, saying, uh, as you probably know, I'm very much engaged uh, in everything in relation to this process of uh, electing new ombudsperson in, uh, uh, in Poland, uh, particularly when it comes to the constitutional court ruling uh, and the worrying developments. I can only assure you that I will continue uh, following this process. And I do agree. Um, we are here somehow not thinking of citizens uh, that should really benefit uh, from uh, these uh, national uh, human rights institutions uh, in democratic society. So if this is not uh, honored uh, by member states, we have even greater problems. Um, what um, um, Dr. Brevik Babdek was saying, uh, I think it's crucial for our discussion on everything uh, today. It is actually political will uh, that is missing uh, in so many member states when it comes to many issues. But if we focus only on the issues of NHRIs, I think it also shows if we look at the states, if we try to assess the independence, the strength, uh, of um, national human rights institutions and, and also uh, officials and, and people working for, for those institutions. Um, 
the long-standing uh, good cooperation with the Scottish NHRI is something that I think is exemplary. Uh, there is a legacy, as, as mentioned, and the involvement of my predecessor, Nils Muzniaks, but also something that uh, we continued and uh, we will continue to do so, not only in relation to Scottish NHRI, but also with all others uh, that are willing to, to work with us. And I know that there are many of you. At the end, uh, I will just mention the, the clear fact that there is absolutely no uh, doubt that the strong, independent uh, and effective NHRI is a pillar of democracy, uh, the rule of law uh, and respect uh, for human rights. Uh, it is not, uh, it is, I think, never enough to emphasize this over and over again. Uh, the contribution to the promotion and uh, protection of human rights in Europe over uh, the past decades um, has been immense from encouraging uh, the ratification of uh, international treaties to monitoring um, their implementation and also encouraging uh, states to address systematic violations. So this is visible, this is, this is known, uh, but we need to do something in order to change everything in relation to threats um, that I already mentioned. And unfortunately, as we speak, those threats uh, are happening in many of our member states. We should not uh, neglect uh, the seriousness of those threats. Um, they are sometimes quite sophisticated uh, and not that visible. Uh, but I can assure you that we do follow uh, all of those. What I would also like to see in several member states, without naming them today, changes in the attitude of um, institutions. I would ask for more independence, uh, more courage, uh, more uh, activity in actually focusing on human rights and not on certain political debates in the country, which I know is a difficult task, uh, but it is possible. Thank you. If uh, then, Judge Motop, please. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the comment of the of the colleague for national institutions. Also, it will be difficult for me to to answer to all this complexity of uh, questions. I will try. Uh, regarding what uh, our Polish colleagues said, uh, of course, the, that we are we are aware about this uh, situation at the level of uh, of the court. Um, as um, Robert Spano, as President Robert Spano said in the, at the beginning of the of our meeting, we change our uh, policy of the court now in the sense that more, even more than before, we are uh, taking into account uh, with priority impact cases on society. It means that uh, all the issues relating to independence and impartiality, uh, in our case that we had, of course, cases of the judiciary, but unfortunately, in many cases, in many cases that are related to uh, the, the threat that exists to any level of the protection of, of human rights, including national human rights institutions, so, as you know, as you know, the court had several cases regarding the threat to, to independent and impartiality of the judiciary. And now, even next, uh, next month, we are going to deal first, the Grand, Grand Jambor is going to deal with a complaint for, uh, from, uh, from Poland. So I think this, as I said before, these issues are related. We all know the case law of the European Court uh, of Justice in uh, this respect. We cooperate uh, very closely with them. And uh, as I said before, it is unfortunately a relation and the court of course is very keen also to the respect of the of the Paris principle of the independence, as I said before, and uh, of the um, of the, the the question of the tenure of the national uh, institution. So we are looking to this uh, uh, this situation with the means that uh, that we uh, have 
towards our uh, our politics of or the the question of the complaints that are submitted to the court. This is our main role in the in the Council of uh, Europe. Regarding the um, uh, regarding the, um, uh, the intervention of our colleague from Slovenia, uh, indeed uh, the role of the the human rights institution is crucial in the process of the implementation of the judgment, especially in some country, as I already said. But she uh, she uh, had the perspective from a national institution, and um, um, the. Um, the way that we are uh, looking to this uh, implementation is uh, and cooperation is that, of course, we are organizing at the level of the court uh, several conferences with the National Human Rights Institution. And also at the level of the implementation, we are cooperating fully with these NGOs regarding the implementation of the, of the judgment. I think that the first, uh, the first seminar of this, uh, this um, European Implementation Network was held uh, by the court, I remember this uh, imp important seminar. So I think that if the national institution will be even more involved in the implementation of the judgment, we, uh, everybody is going to, to benefit at the level of the in Europe. And of course, the first the first to benefit is the individual. This is the center, as you said, the citizen, the individual. This is the center of our uh, debate here in human rights. We don't have other centers. So this will be the, the, the first one. Uh, also, I was very pleased to, to listen for, uh, for established, such an established uh, institution like the Scottish, uh, Scottish one and all, you know, the uh, the positive developments and the things that uh, that happen to their uh, uh, level. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Judge Montag. Ms. Luc Ms. Lucas, if it's possible, your uh, thoughts about the questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. I think these last three interventions in particular showed how how really important uh, the cooperation and the strengthening of NHRIs is, especially when human rights and the rule of law are under stress, as we just heard very vividly from, from the uh, colleague uh, from Poland. Uh, and uh, this is maybe sort of the, 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 the risk side where we need really to be very attentive. On the, on the, other, on the other side, I'm very happy uh, to hear the intervention from uh, our colleague from Scotland, that they want to use the procedure of the European Social Charter to, um, yeah, to to maybe have more leverage regarding uh, the effects of the COVID pandemic. I think this is very important. Uh, also, hope that the guide that will be brought out in summer will be helpful for other NHRIs to use this uh, platform, this procedure. Um, so that, and I think this this echoes what what all my co-panelists have said that we need this first-hand information on the ground by NHRIs. Otherwise, we cannot work properly. So I I'm, I'm very thankful for their work, uh, for the NHRIs' work, um, and for this event. I think it it was really really fantastic uh, to be part of it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Last but not least, Ms. Bilkova, your thoughts about uh, the questions of the, of the people from the audience. I believe that the interventions uh, by the three colleagues from Poland, Slovenia and Ireland have already been addressed by, by the previous speakers. I just echo what has been said by them. Since there is a specific question for me in the chat, I will use this opportunity to address it. So uh, under its statute, the Venice Commission may be requested to produce an opinion by a state, and there is no further specification in the statute. This has traditionally been interpreted as referring mainly to the main bodies of the state. That means the parliaments, governments, and heads of states, which may require any type of opinion, obviously within the mandate, of the Venice Commission. Yet it has also gradually been established that other bodies, other national bodies with a constitutional mandate, with, a, with an explicit constitutional basis, may require 
I may request opinions as well, obviously, to the extent that the activities of the Venice Commission are relevant for them. And more specifically, this uh, interpretation has led to the introduction of two specific types of, op of opinions, so-called amicus curiae opinions, which are requested by constitutional courts, and ombuds, uh, amicus ombuds opinions, which are requested by ombuds institutions, by potentially also open to other national human rights institutions with a constitutional mandate. So much for the question. And now, just by means of really of conclusion, I would like to largely repeat what, what, I, what I said earlier, namely that the Venice Commission really sees national human rights institutions as crucial actors at the national level. In our opinion, there is no one else who could do the same job in the same quality, to the same extent, and in the same way. The absence of national human rights uh, institutions means always a gap in the national human rights uh, landscape. And the second issue, I, I stress the partnership, the viable partnership that exists between the Venice Commission and national and some national human rights institutions. And I would like to repeat that the Venice Commission is, is really uh, ready and willing to continue this cooperation and to look for new ways in which this cooperation could be strengthened. Thank you and thank you for this really very interesting event. Thank you very much. I would like to thank the distinguished speakers for their contribution that enriched our understanding of the recommendation. Without any doubt, your contributions provided much food for thought on further developing strategic follow-up on the recommendation as we will uh, be further discussing this thing by NHRI heads amongst each other tomorrow, as I previously stated. And um, so after this big thanks for everyone, I would uh, like to give the floor for the closing words to Ms. Sigrid Jakobai, representative of the German federal government for matters related to, nation, to human rights, uh, followed by our one and only Debbie Connor and regenerative General Secretary. The floor is yours. And for me, thank you and very much for this opportunity. Thank you very much. And once again, uh, hello from Berlin. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, gentlemen, on behalf of the German Presidency, uh, of the Council of Europe and the German Federal Ministry of Justice and uh, Consumer Protection, I would like to press, express my heartfelt uh, thanks to the European Network of National Human Rights Institutions, as well as today's moderators and panelists for this meeting, which has been fruitful and at the same time encouraging for our future work. We are living in rather challenging times. It is therefore all the more heartening to have witnessed such a successful conference. The result of cooperation between different stakeholders working together for the same cause, uh, the protection of human rights. I fully agree with Henry and the panelists. The adoption of the recommendation was a milestone. And I can assure you that Germany is way more than an appreciative bystander. We are taking an active part in strengthening and supporting the role of national human rights institutions. This is essential not only for achieving the best possible protection of human rights. For a government representative like me, it is also very much a needed act of support. Strong and independent national human rights institutions strengthen and stabilize democratic systems that are based on the rule of law and founded on the protection of human rights. We need these structures as citizens, as a society, but of course also as governments. Um, I followed the discussions today with great interest and I would just like to uh, point out maybe uh, two keywords that uh, were mentioned by almost all um, uh, panelists and speakers, that is sufficient funding and uh, the independence, uh, which also Commissioner Miatovic uh, has pointed out again um, in, in great depth. And I think these are the preconditions that have to be met if we want to establish um, uh, uh, resilient and strong institutions. The adoption of the recommendation is therefore a hugely important achievement. And it is now up to all of us to make the most of this by disseminating the recommendation, encouraging follow-up work, and never ceasing to look for further ways to strengthening cooperation between stakeholders. 
Um, the interaction between stakeholders has also been mentioned by many speakers. And uh, there was one picture that I memorize and which has been mentioned by uh, many of the panelists. And that is that uh, national human rights institutions can be bridge builders. And I think that is a very nice picture. It's a very good picture that uh, for me stands for a little bit as for the, for the result of this morning of discussions. And with this picture of uh, bridge building, I think I would like to uh, close uh, um, my, my remarks, and I very much uh, thank you for your attention. And uh, I hand over the floor now to Mrs. Kona, the Secretary General of ENRI, who will conclude our meeting. Thank you very much again. Thank you very much, Dr. Jacobi, and thank you again to the German Presidency of the Committee of Ministers uh, for co-hosting this event, and also for for really looking to the follow-up to the implementation during your presidency of the Committee of Ministers. And we have indeed heard that this recommendation truly has a difference. It truly has a possibility to make a difference if it is implemented. And so I would like to really focus uh, my concluding remarks, especially as you've all been generous to stay beyond uh, the advertised time of the meeting, um, to really look forwards and see how can we ensure this implementation what ideas have we heard today? Um, first and foremost, I think, and in relation to member states, we have heard about the urgent need to ensure the establishment, the full independence and strengthening of NHRIs and ensuring an enabling environment so that they can work effectively, so that they are not under attack and that the public can have access to them and they have access to information needed. We also heard the excellent idea that NHRIs could even uh, publish on an annual basis the progress that member states are making in implementing the recommendation. Secondly, in terms of cooperation with the Council of Europe, I won't mention all of the ways in which NHRIs are already cooperating, but we did hear a call for more consistent cooperation or participation in Council of Europe processes. We heard about the very good example of how the uh, Conference of International NGOs has this participatory status and a call for this to be extended to NHRI and also for NHRIs to have access to information from Council of Europe through an online portal and also to more easily be able to provide information from the ground in country to the different Council of Europe bodies. A second idea that we heard was for a permanent rapporteur to be set up at PACE, which could also monitor uh, the implementation of the recommendation and perhaps provide more support to those NHRIs who might come under attack, as is already provided by the Commissioner's Office. We heard the suggestion that cooperation programmes could potentially be extended to all states throughout the Council of Europe and perhaps ENRI could also provide a role in this regard, given that there were calls for a network for greater exchange, solidarity, and to facilitate change with the Council of Europe, which ENRI is already provided, but which we heard that if it is strengthened, there are more possibilities to fulfill this potential. And so work with the Council of Europe to make its objectives of respect for human rights, democracy, and rule of law a reality across Europe and for the lived experiences of individuals within Europe. Now, I know I've only mentioned a few of the ideas. I know also that many of you didn't have an opportunity to put forward your suggestions for implementation of the recommendation. But you will have an opportunity to do so when we send out a very brief evaluation form to you this afternoon. You can also comment at that point on the substance of this conference. As Arinda mentioned, tomorrow, the heads of NHRIs from across the ENRI network will meet in a strategic meeting to really look at an action plan in order to ensure that all NHRIs and ENRI as a network can work towards implementation, both at national and European level. We will share this action plan with you, and we really look forward to working with you all. And I've heard from so many speakers on um, some excellent actions could be taken within your own mandates in order to move forward uh, in the implementation. 
So beyond thanking the German presidency, I'd also really like to thank all of the speakers, the moderators, those who ask questions. Um, I'd like to thank the Secretariat and in particular, uh, Katrine Moywissen for her organization, Christos and Nina for managing the platform, Gabriel for the chat box and Martina and Valentina for comms. They put a lot of work into this event today. And I'd like to thank all of you participants for staying with us even 10 minutes beyond the end of the conference. And I call on us all to really use this momentum to move forwards. And I really look forward to working with you for making this difference to human rights, rule of law and democracy across Europe. Thank you all very much and until very soon. Goodbye.